Hi, my name is Anna. You may know me from Power Rangers, Spartacus, Kevin in the Woods, Anger Management. Depends what you're into. And you are listening to Neil Before Pa. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Life is. Hello and welcome to Neil Before Pod, the podcast that is in desperate search of an anchor being. And yes, I did say anchor. I'm your host Craig and we are here to discuss the hotly anticipated lighting up the box office movie Deadpool and Wolverine. Joining me for this is a special team up. I've lifted them from the multiverse to help save something. It's Darren Mooney. Hello. Hello. How are things? Things are good, except for I forgot the really pithy, funny introduction I was going to use. So if I remember it, I'll just say it later on and then it'll... Make no sense, but what is making sense? It's okay. I'm, I'm sitting here in my pajamas. So I'm ready to go. <laughs> Drinking at a bar in my regular person clothes, wearing my pajamas under it like a totally normal human being. Wearing your very bulky... Yeah, my very bulky bright painted armor clothes underneath it. That would not fit under those clothes. That's superhero logic though, isn't it? It is. Anyway, as we said, we're going to talk about Deadpool and Wolverine. Marvel, sort of Marvel. It's not really it. Kind of is and kind of isn't. Ah, it is. It opens with the Marvel fanfare. It opens it with sure Daredevil does. humming the Marvel fanfare. It opens with a Kevin Feige production on screen. It is very much a Marvel film and it's being sold as Marvel's return to greatness after what has been a rocky couple of years for the brand. If people are going to criticize superhero fatigue, the decline of Marvel Studios, un- undoubtedly we will probably circle back around to it next year or the year after or the year after that whenever blade finally comes out but i think we do have to give credit where credit's due this is a marvel studios production through and through and a massive financial and cultural success for them as well yeah so let's start with non-spoiler thoughts and for anybody who might be wondering the film is a hard r rating so people might be wondering about the aversion to profanity on this podcast how we're going to approach that and my approach is Fuck it. We're going for the explicit rating. <laughs> okay, okay. I was just worried I'd sworn already. I was like a sailor. I'm going to tick that E box when I upload <laughs> yeah, it and then yeah. we're fine. No one will question us. So I'll get to swear for once. I'll try and tone it down though. It's however many years of unchecked profanity just releasing itself in one podcast. Don't worry. We will talk about pegging, but we won't participate in any pegging. We will talk about cocaine. We will not participate in any cocaine. We're going to operate by Deadpool and Wolverine rules here, people. Don't say the C word. <laughs> or any slang terms. They've got a list. Oh, you can say the or word though. You can. So without spoiling, why don't you just detail what you thought of this movie? Just in a high level level. I feel really bad, Craig. I know that this is meant to be a three person podcast and I assumed that there would be a balance to it, but I unfortunately really, 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 really did not care for Deadpool and Wolverine. And because this is the nature of things now and everything has become conspiratorial and everybody has to justify their positions, just in case anybody cares, I really enjoyed the first two Deadpool movies. And I'm sure I'll talk about what I loved about them or what I really enjoyed about them as we get into the discussion of this movie and why this is was a different experience for me. And then I also love Logan. And I, like everybody else on the planet, have very mixed opinions of Fox's larger X-Men franchise. Some of them are very good, some of them are very bad. But like I do do love fun and I do love blockbusters. There's this knee-jerk anti-intellectualism when you engage in criticism of Deadpool and Wolverine where the, the response is, oh, well, you guys just hate fun. You don't like this movie because it's silly or it's goofy or it's profane or it's irreverent. And actually quite the opposite. I really wanted to like this. Really enjoyed the first two. Really loved Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, particularly in Logan. And I just found this an incredibly cynical and soulless experience. I found it to be very calculated, very much driven by the cold, harsh corporate logic of how 
movie studios operate today, where this is perhaps the first billion dollar film to be explicitly about a corporate merger between two major studios in Hollywood, and how much of the movie is predicated on the assumption of the audience not only recognizing the individual elements within the movie, say characters or actors that they love, but also reading the trades or reading celebrity gossip and pointing and referencing those things. And what I found sorely missing from the movie was any sense of of heart or humanity or warmth. I believe it was Scott Mendelson, formerly of Forbes, now I believe of Puck, who described it as the experience of watching a serial killer eulogize their victims, where this is a movie made by Walt Disney Company about how they bought Fox and all these wonderful misfit toys that they inherited from Fox and that they have erased from existence, but they're going to take them out for one last ride because they realize that they can be milked for nostalgia or affection. And I just found myself very alienated by that, very pushed out of the story by that, very wary, just cynical and tired of it in a way that reminded me of recent movies, what might be called spreadsheet movies, movies like, for example, The Flash over at DC is a great example last year. We can even go back to say Ready Player One or Space Jam A New Legacy. Movies that are like, look at all this cool stuff that these studios now own, these intellectual property libraries that they hold. And it often feels like, I apologize, Craig, this is very heavy straight away, (laughs) but it reminds me of that experience of being a kid. And maybe this is not a universal experience. Maybe this is just a particularly Darren experience, but having a kid, having a friend who's the rich kid who owns all of these wonderful toys and objects and things that you dream about and fantasize about and recognize and being taken on a guided tour of their house and being told that under no circumstances can you touch any of these nice toys because they all belong to this rich friend of yours who's delighted in showing you that they own this stuff, but isn't actually ever going to play with it in any meaningful way. And as a kid, I found that very sad and affecting, and I really hope the kid in question isn't listening to this podcast. No judgment to them whatsoever. Oh, I hope they are. (laughs) I really don't, Greg. As an adult, I do find myself similarly disenchanted and disaffected and just sinking into my chair and wondering, what does this movie think that I want from it? And what does this movie think think that it is offering me that will bring me joy. And I accept I'm in the minority on that. Obviously, this is a hugely successful movie. Reviews are broadly speaking positive. It's on its way to make a billion dollars. As we talked about, it's going to turn around the narrative of Marvel fatigue or superhero fatigue or whatever. Theater owners are delighted to see it. By most accounts, everybody's having a really good time with it. But yeah, I watched this and I felt weirdly empty inside, which is a very strange and personal confession to make in a podcast. Sorry, Craig. (laughs) Well, as someone that's occupying the other side, I'm obliged to say, I'm going to fight you now. Okay. Can we do it twice? At least. Why not? And it's okay because we'll both regenerate, so there's no lasting consequences whatsoever. It doesn't mean anything, Greg. We'll talk about that. We will talk about that. I really like that. And I can see your reading of it. And yes, I'm fully aware that corporations like Disney or Warner Brothers or whoever are evil. And they don't care a jot about the intellectual property that they're spending money adapting. We always talk about the people call it content soup. I call it content sludge because soup at least has some (laughs) consistency. Whereas sludge is just, it's there. And it's there for you to step in and you don't have to really do much with it. But I think that sometimes they can hire people that maybe have an earnest respect for the things that are being adapted. And that's how you get things like Andor. I'm not going to say this is on the level of Andor, but that's how you get things like Andor, where just accidentally you hire the right people and they can make a good go of something. And maybe the studio think, yeah, that's fine. I can let this thing exist in its current form for whatever reason. And I do think there was some genuine earnestness towards the Fox era of Marvel movies, the importance of these things existing in terms of the cultural moment we're in now, as in you wouldn't have the MCU without the X-Men. You just wouldn't because someone was brave enough to make an X-Men movie. And the joke it's made in this film about he's wearing a costume, like he's not embarrassed to be in a superhero movie. And there was that kind of element to it in X-Men 1. Why aren't they wearing their iconic costumes? Why are they wearing these weird black leather matrix numbers? Just because it was the time it was made, I guess someone felt that there's only so far we can take this and yellow spandex is too far. We can't have that. But it moved on and on and on. Then you got Spider-Man, which was far more comic accurate. And then comic accuracy became more important as time went on and became more accepted as time went on, even in the X-Men movies. 
when you look at the reboots. First class, they're wearing the blue and gold, yeah. Yeah, first class and then the last five minutes of Apocalypse. (laughs) <laughs> when they're wearing their proper costumes and then they switch to the more generic yellow ones in Dark Phoenix. Dark Phoenix. Not even X-Men Dark Phoenix, just Dark Phoenix. Well, my Blu-ray says X-Men Dark Phoenix. Oh, okay. All right. Maybe they rebranded it. It retains its title somewhere. So I thought there was a bit of earnestness to this. I do think that Sean Levy and Ryan Reynolds gave a damn to some degree. And I do think that actually comes across. And I think we'll definitely get into the way that they handle certain elements. Obviously, we're not in spoilers, so we can't spoil who cameos, even though Marvel did that at Comic-Con. They brought them all out on stage and said, they're all in this. The day the movie opened, they were like, hey, look at these people here. And again, there's a broader discussion to be had, and maybe this is just a reflection of the broader mood of the moment. But the things like the spoiler embargo which elapses on the Monday after the second weekend which is a way of the studio regulating when and how people can talk about the content of a movie but which also serves the if you're being slightly cynical purpose of getting the fear of missing out people to go in the second weekend by putting a deadline on it so it's like if you don't want to know whether the beloved X-Men character Maggot appears in this movie you better get your ass to the cinema by the end of the second weekend and boost those box office numbers I understand there is that obvious fanish affection, and I am a fan myself. I absolutely love all that stuff. I was able to pull the name Maggot out of my ass, <laughs> referencing an obscure X-Men who will never appear in live action. But the corporate machinations of it do feel very obvious. And I feel like when you're making a movie like this that is explicitly about the corporate machinations, it's very hard to be about anything other than that. Yeah. And we'll get into how I think it deals with that as well, because there was clearly a, maybe not so much a mandate, but there was clearly an idea of how we're going to handle certain things now that the buyout has happened, because there is the Deadpool of it all. And that's kind of what this film is about. What do we do about this successful property? Or rated franchise, which isn't part of the Disney family brand. Coming out a week before the Alien reboot under the Disney brand as well. Yeah, when we're planning to reboot all the X-Men characters. But yeah, we have this one that's still popular. So what do we do about that? That's kind of on a meta level what this film is about. But yeah, I I liked it a lot. And I'm not at the stage where I'm going to assume every MCU property is terrible because I think a lot of people are at that stage. And there's a lot of people that don't want to turn out to these anymore because they feel that the quality is diminished. And I mean, that's not unfair, but what I'm seeing from particularly Comic-Con is that zero lessons have been learned from their missteps. I feel like if I'm going to be harsh about Deadpool and Wolverine, I need to be at least reasonably fair to Marvel Studios, the faceless corporation behind Deadpool and Wolverine. It's worth noting that last year, in my own top 10, in the top 10 highest grossing movies of the year, and in many other critics' top 10, there was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. So there is a qualitative and box office argument that when Marvel Studios make a good movie, people will turn out and see it. Of course, there's also evidence based on not only the streaming failures, like, say, Secret Invasion, but also last year at the Marvels and Quantumania, that when Marvel make a subpar product that doesn't necessarily generate any interest, audiences will not turn out to see it. And I do think the studio is in shaky waters, but I think... Reports of the studio's demise have been greatly exaggerated. That said, I agree entirely about the cynicism radiating off this and the announcement, say, at Comic-Con the weekend that this released, where we are going all in on nostalgia. It really does feel like Marvel have looked at this and gone, well... We made a movie that brought back two characters from another franchise that we didn't own, but which we bought, and a billion dollars worth of people are going to turn out to see it. Therefore, logically, what we should do is we should bring back people that audiences remember from our own films, whether creatively or in terms of in front of the camera or, say, behind an iron mask of some description. (laughs) And we should find a way to milk that. That is the thing that makes me really cynical about this movie in particular. I was on talking about Madam Web with you earlier in the year, and it was a wonderful conversation, very fun conversation of a very bad movie. <laughs> and to be clear, I don't think, say, Deadpool and Wolverine is worse than Madam Web. But if people ask me which movie do I feel worse about, I didn't enjoy either of them. I found both of them very difficult to watch. But when I was watching Madam Web, At no point in my brain were the synapses firing saying, well, okay, Darren, you're going to have another 10 years of people trying to make a movie like Madam Web, (laughs) which is what was just hammering inside my skull watching Deadpool and Wolverine. Not only am I not enjoying the experience of watching this movie, I am also cognizant of the fact that based on the reception that it is likely to have, I am going to be spending 10 years watching the variations of this movie. That is the thing that kind of confounds me, is that this is in some ways positioned as a goodbye, 
ostensibly, without getting into spoilers about particular scenes, the opening credits play over Bye 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 by NSYNC, for example. And there is a sense of one last time, Hugh Jackman is coming back and we're bidding farewell. And as you said, the X-Men are now owned by Disney again. The film rights have been acquired by Disney. Therefore, we're going to reboot. We're going to bring back new X-Men characters. But also, every single thing that we have seen from Marvel with the X-Men brand. And I don't know how specific I can get without getting into spoilers, but let's say X-Men the Animated Series, which is great. Loved X-Men the Animated Series. One of the best shows on Disney+. Plus. Had a really great time with it. Really looking forward to the second season of it. But that is just a revival of a Fox Kids show. You mean 97? X-Men 97, sorry. X-Men 92 was the original year it was released. The animated series was what they called the 92 one. 97 is the fault. Just for technical accuracy, in case anyone's checking. Technically correct. The best kind of correct, Craig. But also, if you look at the X-Men who've appeared in the streaming shows or in the movies, you've had the use of the X-Men theme song from X-Men 92. Thank you, Craig. In Miss Marvel, Patrick Stewart has reprised his role. Kelsey Grammer has popped up somewhere. I'm not going to tell you where. And obviously Evan Peters has popped up in a cameo that is very explicitly referencing his role in the X-Men movies. And it does feel like so much of this is backwards looking. And it's like, at the moment, it doesn't feel like we bought the X-Men brand with a view to all the fun stuff that we could do with it in the future. It really feels like we brought the X-Men brand so we could engage in cultural fracking of wringing every last bit of value by reminding you of the things that you loved about it. And for me, Deadpool and Wolverine didn't feel like a goodbye. It felt worryingly like a mission statement for everything that Marvel's been doing with these characters since they acquired them back in 2018. That's the tension for me with the movie. It doesn't feel like the end. It worryingly feels like the start. You were talking about Madam Web. You weren't worried about having to watch another 10 years of films like Madam Web, but isn't Madam Web the end of 10 years of trying to make <laughs> films like Madam Web? Hey, 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 it's going to be a very craving Christmas. <laughs> it's the last gasp of that thing that started with The Amazing Spider-Man 2, the let's try and infinitely spin out Spider-Man into a million spin-offs, even though nobody cares. Her web connects us all, Greg. Was it somebody pointed out that the thing about No Way Home is that it has a Sinister Five? We talked about that during Madam Web, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's why I feel more fondly towards Madam Web, because there's the sweet release of the void afterwards. This is an acknowledged failure. They're going to stop it now. <laughs> Even if they continue doing this, they're going to be doing it less frequently than they were. <laughs> Jury's out on how well Venom will do and Craven, I suppose. At least Venom is its own particular brand of crazy. I do not like the first Venom. I actually quite enjoy the second one. But at least Venom is its own thing. And whatever you say about Craven, it's Shandor though, isn't it? That's the thing about Craven. I know it's probably going to be bad, Craig. Don't get me wrong. I'm under no illusions. <laughs> But I'm also like, the guy who did Margin Call and Triple Frontier and All Is Lost, this could be the daddest movie that ever dadded. <laughs> but we've seen before Sony are able to attract talent somehow <laughs> and then deploy them very poorly. Russell Crowe being like, you said I was in a fucking Spider-Man movie. <laughs> I was told that Spider-Man would be here. He is not. Hops on his Vespa and rides out of the Sony Pictures <laughs> lot. Since we've been gently touching the fourth wall, or the spoiler wall, should we just get Deadpool to take us into spoilers with some glib remark? Go ahead, Deadpool. Let's do it. Deadpool, take us in. Oh, I'm touching myself tonight. Okay, so we were touching on the narrative and about how it is about a corporate merger, and it very much is. And like I said, it's this idea of Disney want to reboot the X-Men. They want to create their own version of the X-Men and we don't know what form that will take or if it'll be better slash worse than what we saw before, but they're going to do it at some point, even though they've been heavily referencing stuff that came before. Like you said, we've had Kelsey Grammer's Beast make a reappearance for some reason. We've had Patrick Stewart's Xavier make a reappearance for some reason. And get his neck broken. Yes, somehow a less effective death than he had before (laughs) in, in Logan, but you have this weird anomaly in the Fox X-Men franchise at this point, where Deadpool is still popular because the first two films are very popular and Kevin Feige likes money. So he said, (laughs) we're not going to change what works here. We are going to give you an R-rated Deadpool movie. Ryan Reynolds is up for it. So they make it. And then the narrative seems to be centered around the fact that you don't fit in this old universe anymore because that's gone and we need to move you to our universe. And then it's kind of about Deadpool resisting that because he gets told his friends can't come with him. It's like, no, no, just you. 
We can reboot your friends. No one cares about them, but we're not going to reboot you. We want you just the way you are, but only you. And obviously he rebels against that. And then this film is largely about him trying to preserve his own continuity and his own place in the universe. And outside of a meta level, it's about the most misfit of people can find a place. And that's what the Deadpool movies have largely been about. Anyway. Yeah. Found families. Yeah. Found families, unconventional families, found in unconventional ways. But the fact that the film ends with him preserving his universe and just staying there is quite interesting to me because it's the idea of, we don't need you to interact with our continuity anymore. And it's the idea of, yeah, we can bring you in whenever we feel like it. Yeah. But he's going to be off in his own little pocket and they're not really going to mess with that. Or certainly that's the message of this film. So I found that really interesting on a meta level, the idea of what do we do with this popular character? Well, we just don't mess with it, really. We don't try and force him into any holes that he doesn't belong as such. And yes, the whole reference was deliberate. (laughs) The problem with that is, though, you know exactly that Jackman and Reynolds are going to be back for Secret Wars. 100%. You know that there's no way this is the last time that you see those two characters. No. And you know that the fact that it closes on the shot of their two helmets together, it's like, yeah, nerds, get ready. You may not feel excited about Brave New World. You may not want to see Thunderbolts. You may never get to see Blade because there's only ever going to be one Blade. <laughs> but you will get excited about Deadpool and Logan coming back for Secret Wars. This is where I find my cynicism crashing against what the movie is ostensibly about. You mentioned the idea of Deadpool being like, my friends are important to me, my continuity is important to me, my history is important to me. Where are Cable, Domino, or the character played by Julian Dennison, who's Fire Fist? Where are the characters that Deadpool sacrificed everything for in Deadpool 2? The characters who were essential to the narrative, who were core to him embracing this idea of a found family unit. Why aren't they here? More broadly speaking, this has the Star Trek Picard season three problem for me, which is Deadpool 1 and Deadpool 2, as you said, have built up this supporting cast around Deadpool. And obviously, TJ Miller, not a good person (laughs) and absolutely should not be back for Deadpool 3. But you've built up this cast of characters like Dopinder like Vanessa, Colossus, Negasonic Teenage Warhead, Yukio. You built up this cast that he has who recur in both of these movies who are fun to be around. And then you just push them, you jettison them out of this movie to make way for, first of all, for the return of Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, which I've accepted is inevitable, was always going to happen. But also to make room for cameos from a bunch of obscure superheroes from 2000s films, from movies that were never made, from X-Men continuity. The buy-in that this movie of me, which is to invest in the emotional journey of Deadpool asserting the importance of his own movies, his own narrative, his own characters. That buy-in is immediately for me lost when the movie's like, oh, by the way, he's no longer with Vanessa. We got all these characters together for a single party scene in his apartment, but we couldn't be arsed even then to bring back Josh Brolin, to bring back Zazie Beetz, to bring back Julian Dennison. We just about brought back Pete. Why is Shatterstar there? (laughs) <laughs> Why is Shatterstar in the nine people who are Deadpool's entire universe when the entire joke in Deadpool 2 was, first of all, that X-Force was incredibly expendable, but also, and I love that Shatterstar was a bit of a prick, <laughs> I believe is an exact quote from Deadpool. The movie asks us to invest in this emotional journey in a sincere and earnest way, but the way the film is constructed immediately makes me skeptical because it just jettisons everything that would be necessary for me to buy into that in an honest kind of emotional way. Well, Cable didn't test well, didn't you listen? <laughs> yeah, X-Force didn't test well, especially Cable. But Zazie Beetz has said she wasn't asked at all. Dennison said he didn't hear back. Cable, you can understand because Brolin played Thanos, although the Marvel Universe is generally trigger happy when it comes to recasting, so I can't imagine it would be that much of a problem. Especially if he's only in that scene. Yeah, and Deadpool 2 included a joke where Deadpool referred to Brolin as Thanos. This is maybe tied to another thing, I'm sure we'll talk about it. The jokes in this movie all flow in one direction, which is towards Fox. It is incredibly deferential. You can feel the butt cheeks clenching at Disney when it comes to making an R-rated superhero spoof that has to interact with the MCU, where all of the MCU stuff is treated generally as, first of all, it's a sacred timeline. It always has been from Loki. One would imagine after they toppled Kang, who was a dictator who was shaping that timeline to benefit himself, they might stop calling it the sacred timeline. But no, apparently it's still the sacred timeline. But that sequence early on where Deadpool goes over to Earth 6 six on the day that Deadpool releases March 2018 or whenever it is and he visits Happy Hogan and the way that scene is shot with the Silvestri score in the background and the loving close-ups of Captain America's shield Iron Man's helmet the trophy from Iron Man proof that Tony Stark has a heart there's this weird thing where the movie 
is more invested in the sacred iconography of the Marvel Cinematic Universe than it is in that idea of this quirky cast of characters that Deadpool 1 and Deadpool 2 established. In that scene, one of the subtle touches that I loved was when it cuts to the picture of what would be Tony Stark and Peter Parker, but in front of the Peter Parker side of the picture is the kid's Iron Man helmet because they retroactively put Peter Parker in Iron Man 2 by saying that kid that Tony saves is Peter Parker as a child. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a cute little story, but it's the idea of, okay, we can't have an image of Tom Holland in this film. <laughs> because we don't have Sony rights. Yeah, we need to go buy Sony. New Line let us use Blade, but Sony's not going to let us use that. But we can have this well-placed prop that will make you think of him if you know enough. And I suppose it also feeds into the idea of, well, no one knows who Peter Parker is at this point. What are we going to do with that? Who knows? But that was a nice little touch. And I, I liked that scene with Happy Hogan because the idea of Deadpool saying, I want to join the MCU. I want to be an Avenger. This is what I think I want. This is what I think I need. I want to matter. Yeah. That desire for purpose. And even Peter says it shortly after, doesn't he? We're humans. We crave purpose and we need purpose and all that stuff. And Wade has this misguided idea that being an Avenger will bring him purpose. So again, on a meta level, the idea of if you join the MCU, if you play with all the other toys, you will suddenly gain purpose. You will gain importance. I was thinking about this in terms of a broader narrative about looking at these superhero movies. So the idea of connectivity became the watchword for a long time, didn't it? The idea of everything is linked. Everybody can meet everybody else and they can all team up and it's going to be amazing. And then people suddenly became dismissive of the idea that things could stand on their own. The X-Men franchise stood on its own for a very long time. And I think the X-Men has a universe of characters by itself that you don't really need to involve any of the other Marvel characters. I know in the comics they do. Well, it arguably becomes more complicated because you have to answer questions like, why doesn't Captain America seem to give a flying fuck about mutants' rights? Yeah. Captain America's a sentinel of liberty, but he's like, ah, no, 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 those actual sentinels, (laughs) not my problem, buddy. Yeah. Why are the X-Men not okay, but Spider-Man is? Why is this person's powers we're okay with that, but these people's powers were not. The Avengers might want to look into some of those attempted genocides against American citizens every once in a while. No, 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 no. We gotta, we gotta deal with this Count Nefaria guy. He's got a monocle. He's a real problem. Kang's at it again. Yeah, yeah. The Fantastic Four are like, I don't know, Galactus might try to eat us any day now. We can't get down from our ivory tower, thanks. Our literal tower, yeah. This almost seems to be a champion of actually being on your own's okay. Being in your own little pocket is okay sometimes, and it kind of proves that it is fine, even though you prove it by him teaming up with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, who is part of his pocket. It's part of that side of the multiverse, isn't it? But they team up and they prove that they don't really need anybody else. Certainly, I think that Deadpool and Wolverine is a fun idea to team up, but equally, you could have done a Deadpool 3 without Wolverine in it, and you could have had just as much fun, possibly. The story that Reynolds tells is they're having difficulty cracking Deadpool 3 for Disney. And the way that he tells it now, I don't know how true this is. I don't know how much of this is embellished for the sake of good storytelling. The publicity campaign for this has been very good, to give credit where it's due. Reynolds and Jackman have both done a really good job pushing this movie, and a large part of success is down to them. But the way that Reynolds tells it, they're having difficulty getting Marvel sold on this. They're having difficulty coming up with a story that they themselves wanted to do. And then out of nowhere, Jackman rings him up on the phone and says, hey, I know I said I was done with the character of Wolverine. You guys are probably already finished on Deadpool 3, but would there be any room for me in Deadpool 3? Because I would like to (laughs) hang out with you and I'd love to actually make a Wolverine Deadpool movie. Now, this is how Reynolds tells it. I imagine there's a certain amount of mythologizing going on there. If we're being entirely cynical, one suspects that the fact that Hugh Jackman just went through a divorce probably may also have contributed to his desire to return to the role. And the movie itself jokes about that, so I don't feel like that's an unfair observation. Yeah, that was harsh. Yeah, there are a couple of moments where the movie treads certain lines. Can we make fun of the Ben Affleck, Jennifer Garner divorce? Garner can. Garner has earned the right to do that. (laughs) Or the moment where Wesley Snipes says, Blade says, because we're now in the spoiler zone, says there's only ever going to be one Blade. And if you're Mahershala Ali in the cinema watching that on opening night, you just throw your popcorn down in frustration (laughs) and say, well, fuck this, Kevin. I'm a two-time Oscar winner. I don't have to put up with this. That joke has changed probably since it was written as well because when it was written the joke is there is going to be another Blade and then now the joke is maybe not (laughs) actually although I think TV Blade is also in this he's in the background in the Ant-Man corpse Okay. Again, this is one of those things about who matters and who doesn't. Another reason I am slightly cynical of this movie is that Marvel and Disney have more money than God. And you do get the joke later on about how the budget won't spread to Magneto. They can't afford to bring back either Fassbender or McKellen. 
or Chris Evans for more than five minutes. Yeah, there is the joke. Do you have any idea what he was doing to the budget when they talked to Chris Evans? <laughs> but there is a lot of stuff here where it's like they bring back Lady Deathstrike and they bring back the Juggernaut from X3. But you go and you talk to Vinnie Jones or you listen to Vinnie Jones give interviews and Vinnie Jones is like, yeah, we couldn't make it work. They couldn't find a way in the budget to fit me in. Is there not something about he didn't want to squeeze back in at the costume as well? Yeah, that's how he he starts the story and then he finishes by saying there wasn't room in the budget for me, which kind of suggests that the real issue wasn't necessarily the costume so much as the bling bling, as it were. It's odd because you could have the Juggernaut in there and you could use the Deadpool 2 Juggernaut, which is the CGI one voiced by Ryan Reynolds. But the fact that you're using the one that was played by Vinnie Jones, he's costumed in exactly the same way. There's something slightly cynical to me about bringing back that particular take on the character, but not being willing to pony up the dough necessary to bring back the actor who played that version of the character. There is something kind of interesting there. Deadstrike is the same, and I'm fairly sure that if Blade from the TV show appeared in the background, I don't imagine it was the actor in question reprising the role. I'm not sure. It was pointed out to me as well, I didn't Ah, actually notice it. But don't you understand, they can't afford Vinnie Jones because they have to save their money to give the budget of six mid-budget movies to three people. (laughs) Yeah, and again, the point is this is going to make more money than God and the amount of money that Marvel spends on this stuff. It's not unreasonable to figure out a way to do that. If you are dedicated with building a love letter to these movies, which is what you claim to be doing, and Reynolds is on record, the story that Reynolds has been telling on the press, or again, it's been a, an old time of a press tour, about foregoing his own salary on the original Deadpool in order to have, is it Reese and Wernick, the two writers who worked on all three Deadpool movies, including this one, to have them on set with him as a sort of mini writer's room on the first Deadpool movie. It is possible. There are ways to do that sort of thing and make those sorts of compromises. And it's the fact that you're not willing to do the compromise necessary to get Vinnie Jones in the movie, despite the fact Vinnie Jones has probably appeared in, what, five direct-to-video movies this year? (laughs) How expensive could he be? (laughs) I want a million dollars a day. And Juggernaut was much more important to the plot back then. That's the kind of thing where I do find, because this is a movie that draws attention to the business side of the equation, I can't help but think of the business side of the equation when things like that happen. And be like, if that is the case, then how compromised is this? If you are writing a love letter to these characters and concepts, how come the only real person you bring back is Hugh Jackman? I know there are obviously cameos from smaller players, but it's hard to believe that you couldn't have got back Famke Janssen, or you couldn't have got back Anna Paquin. Patrick Stewart came back for the Multiverse of Madness. If you were willing to open the checkbook or if you were willing to make accommodations, you probably could have got more people in here. But it's weird that we end up going with the people who we go with and then treating them as if they are a love letter to these films. And then including the credits reel at the end, which actually features, say, Halle Berry, who talked about how she didn't get asked back to do this. It's a who counts and who doesn't, who's worth celebrating and who's not worth celebrating. Are we celebrating the people who made these movies or are we celebrating the IP iconography and imagery that is part of the backlot that Disney bought as part of purchasing Fox? I am comfortable and I like the idea of doing one of those things but I find myself uncomfortable with doing the other. And to be clear, I don't mean we should celebrate Brian Singer or Brett Ratner in case there's any ambiguity there, in case anybody thinks that's what I'm saying. I'm more saying like, it'd be nice to see James Marston. It'd be nice to see Ty Sheridan. It'd be nice to see people who gave of themselves to these films get celebrated. If this movie is about celebrating those films, then celebrating the people who made those films feels like an important part of that to me, which the movie doesn't really do. Although one of the things I did like about it is it wasn't overloaded with cameo. So you didn't have just people that would appear just to wink at the camera and say, hey, I'm here. I feel like, well, I feel two things about the cameos, or I think cameos is the wrong word because some of them are just roles. Supporting roles. Yeah, like the four characters, five characters. There are five basic big supporting roles from cameos. There's Evans, there's Keen, there's Garner there's Snipes and there's Tatum. Those are supporting roles. Yeah. And of those actors that appear, the only necessary one for what happens in the plot is actually Daphne Keen because she's the one that approaches Logan and has the conversation by the fire. Yeah. Gets him back on task. But yeah, you could have accomplished something similar with Rogue, I suppose, if she'd shown up and said, you know, you were the one that rescued me from that fire or whatever. You're the one that healed me when Magneto took my powers, that kind of stuff. Or I took Magneto's powers. You could have probably done it with Rogue, but at the same time, I think the Daphne Keen thing was effective. All the others, 
they do perform a function in the plot, but they could also be swapped out with pretty much anybody and you wouldn't have to change all that much. There is a real sense of we got the people we got. And when we got Jennifer Garner, did we ask Ben Affleck just for shits and giggles? Blade is probably unique there. But when we got Tatum, there's like a dozen other actors who are almost in superhero movies and we could have substituted them in anyway. Although Channing Tatum is so grateful that he's in this movie. It's the realisation of his dream. And I like the way that they tailored his dialogue as well, as if to say, I think I've always been in limbo. I don't think I've ever really existed. And again, this is that to the Scott Mendelson criticism of it, where the movie does try to wring some genuine pathos out of he never got his shot. Channing Tatum as Gambit never really got a fair shake. It's obviously ridiculous. They spoofed the accent. Who is your dialogue coach? I'm sorry, we're going to need a second take on that. <laughs> they do spoof the inherent absurdity of the concept. Oh, your superpowers close up magic. You look like Hawkeye if he had superpowers. They do spoof elements of it, but you are meant to take at least some of it achingly sincere. This is a character who is a second stringer. This is an actor who wanted to play that character who, for the better part of a decade, was chasing that, pushing that boulder up that hill. And the issue is that that movie wasn't cancelled by Fox. That movie was cancelled by Disney. And you're back to the Mendelssohn critique of a serial killer who is wistfully eulogizing their own victims. You could make a Gambit movie for about half of what you're paying Hugh Jackman. You could put a reasonably moderately budgeted Gambit movie together that would let Channing Tatum show me his take on the character, show me his concept, and have have a bit of fun with it that I would enjoy in its own terms instead of building a movie around referencing the fact that it's very sad that we never got a Gambit movie starring Channing Tatum. I hate to keep going back to the word cynical, but it does feel so, so cynical to me that this is happening in this way and I'm being asked to feel sad that Disney decided not to give Channing Tatum his Gambit movie by Disney. If you divorce the Disney of it all, which of course is impossible, but if you think about, well, maybe Sean Levy and Ryan Reynolds are sad that Channing Tatum didn't get his Gambit movie and if you acknowledge them as strong creative voices in the context of this film then you can see them being a bit nostalgic for what never was and I think Channing Tatum's again this is all meta Channing Tatum's reaction to appearing in this film is he seems very happy that he got to do it and yeah I don't think this is anything like Channing Tatum's Gambit as it would have been he wouldn't have worn the costume you'd have got the trench coat probably you might have got the bow staff you would have got the cards obviously and he wouldn't have spoken in such a thick accent that's incomprehensible but again that's the joke the idea of if you were real you would have a dialect coach and we would be able to understand a word you were saying i liked all that actually and i think when it makes those references it doesn't linger on it for too long so it makes its joke then it moves on so it's not that you're putting the film on hold for such a long time to drink in these references you get zero backstory for electra as well but those characters when they go into the ant-man corpse pim falls or whatever it's called when they make their stand this is meant to be a big triumphant moment for them and it just rings so hollow to me because if you wanted to give Jennifer Garner's Electra a fair shake, you have the opportunity to do it. I don't think you should. <laughs> I think we should all forget that Electra ever happened. I think it's a bad movie. I've never seen it all the way through. I've seen bits and pieces of it, but I don't think I've ever sat and watched it start to finish. I have, of course, seen Daredevil which is not very good. Yeah, that's enough for anybody. Somehow Electra's worse. And it's a shame because I really like Rob Bowman, the director. He directed several episodes of The X-Files, which I love, and it killed his career. But if you want to engage in the rehabilitation process of Electra, there is a model for that. And the model for that is you make a good movie starring Electra. You don't try to make me nostalgic for a bad movie star. Like, this is one of those things where I find, this is maybe a bigger conversation than Deadpool and Wolverine, but this idea of milking nostalgia for things that we we didn't like the first time around. A part of me has made my peace with, we will always be inherently nostalgic for things that we loved as children. The Star Trek Picard season three, not my cup of tea, but I can understand it because I love Star Trek The Next Generation. Everybody loves Star Trek The Next Generation, right? Bring back more Star Wars stuff. Obviously, I love Star Wars, so I understand why you would want to make more of that. But it's not even things where some people think that it's great and I just personally don't really glom to it because I can obviously understand that. I'm not completely lacking in empathy. But it's things where we collectively as a culture agreed that these things were bad and that they were awful and that there were good things that existed and we knew that they were good because they were different from the bad things. The primary purpose of bad superhero movies was to make the good superhero movies stand out by comparison. So instead of watching Daredevil and Electra, you're like, actually, X2 is pretty freaking good. The first two Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies, pretty freaking good. There's this move in modern culture where, let's set aside nostalgia for the Star Wars prequels. Let's accept the Star Wars prequels are contested. There's a generation that grew up earnestly loving those. But something like, say, 
say the Amazing Spider-Man movies, which you and I have both turned into a punching bag, I think before we started recording even, those are movies that everybody agreed was bad when they came out. I actually like the first Amazing Spider-Man film quite a bit. Ooh. I think it's a hodgepodge of different ideas jockeying for attention. And I do think the studio wanted a certain thing and maybe the director wanted another thing. But I actually think you get something that's quite earnest in the middle of that somewhere in terms of, say, Andrew Garfield being cast and things. And the Amazing Spider-Man movies have had a bit of a reappraisal of late. And I think the run-up and the fallout of No Way Home has, has changed that. And you mentioned the Star Wars prequels. They've had a bit of a reappraisal as well. So it's almost this, yeah, we all agreed this was bad at some point, but actually somehow nostalgia has sprung forth and maybe this will happen with some of these Fox things. Maybe this will happen with the legend. It's nostalgia as an end unto itself. You know that joke in The Sopranos, remember when is the lowest form of conversation? But this isn't even remember the good times. This is just remember. Remember for the sake of remembering unto itself. Which I find very disconcerting just to contextualise and understand where we are. Where it's, yeah, yeah, I might want to go back to the early 2000s, but if I'm going back to the early 2000s, I want to go back to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Or, and I'm sorry to invoke him again, and Brian Singer's first two X-Men movies. I don't want to go back to Elektra. <laughs> I want to go back to Blade, but I don't necessarily want to go back to Blade Trinity. It's weird where it doesn't matter what the quality of the thing we're nostalgic about is. It doesn't matter whether it was any good. It just matters that it's old. There's also a underlying message of the importance of these things, even if they were bad. So the idea of these things were made when we were figuring out the superhero formula. We didn't quite know what was going to work, what was not going to work, where we were going with it. And then the MCU came along and supposedly nailed it, even though Iron Man is structurally about the same as the Fantastic Four. Yeah. Or the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie. It's the origin story, conflict in the second act, blowout in the third act. Yeah. And broadly speaking, I think Marvel have been following that formula ever since. It just seems like they've disguised it a bit better than some of the others have maybe, at least in their better days. But I think acknowledging the importance of these things is, is quite interesting. The idea that maybe they were messy and the quality wildly varied, but also <laughs> at some point someone cared about some of this stuff. I think Chris Evans has talked fondly about playing the Human Torch. He enjoyed it. I think other aspects aspects of these characters meant something to someone and I actually don't mind the two Fantastic Four movies that Chris Evans is in. The one made by Josh Trank can piss off. <laughs> it's horrible, but... I think you mean Fantforstic. Fantforstic, yeah. That was the one where I got an email from someone at Fox after I reviewed it asking me to revise my review. Wow. Not offering to send me to see it or give me anything. They just said, could you see it again and revise your opinion? Could you fix your brain? Fix your heart? So I'll have a frontal lobotomy then I'll go watch it and then I'll rewrite my review. I just replied with, I don't think a repeat viewing would change my opinion anyway. And I've never seen it since. You say that, Craig, and in 10 years, we'll have a cycle of one of these movies where like out of the portal and we'll walk Jamie Bell's thing, voiced by an AI <laughs> version of Jamie Bell. And again, this is maybe my cynicism of the Disneyness of it, but you mentioned that idea of remembering how we got here and the nostalgia of it. Part of me does worry that that's what this movie is structurally doing. Remember the time before the MCU and all these superhero movies were just these misshapen blobs what we didn't know what to do with them we're affectionate and we remember them but they're all basically the same it doesn't matter whether it's blade or electra it doesn't matter whether it's the fantastic four or it's x2 they're misbegotten shapes that are evolutionary steps on the ladder that got us to the mcu which is the office that happy lives in where we play the alan Silvestri score and we shoot it like it's heaven <laughs> if I'm being cynical, I'm watching this and I'm thinking, to that point of being nostalgic for the sake of nostalgia, is the subtext of that, there is no difference between Elektra and X2. They're all just pre-Marvel movies. They're all in the same pot. They're all part of the same DNA. When in reality, the difference is X2 is one of the greatest summer blockbusters ever made and Elektra is one of the worst. And it's just like, no, this is all just in the collective uh, unconscious. This is all just in the primordial stew from which evolved the sacred timeline. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely see that reading, but I also think the film handles it a little bit more earnestly than that. I'm using the word earnestly a lot. It's okay, I'm using cynical a lot, so we're balancing each other out. Matter and antimatter. That's it, perfectly balanced, as everything should be. But I do think there is some genuine affection there. And I rewatched the Tim Story Fantastic Four movies over the weekend, just because I saw Spider-Man in the cinema. Because yeah, because they're, they're coming the back, yeah. season at Cineworld, yeah. So, I watch, so I'm going to watch them all, including the amazing ones. I haven't seen the amazing Spider-Man 2 in a while, and I just want to see how it's aged or how my view of it is aged. I imagine very poorly. I should be clear, I'm critical of nostalgia. I'm here for the Sam Raimi Spider-Man cinematic re-releases. Nostalgia does work on me. It's just I do find myself when the movie is about nostalgia working on me, I start to feel the prongs in my brain. <laughs> As opposed to just watching these movies, which I remember fondly, and which are still great. Well, Fantastic Four, 
those two movies, they exist because Spider-Man exists. Oh yeah, that was part of the gold rush. Spider-Man was the starting point. I know X-Men gets a lot of credit. Blade obviously deserves a lot of credit as well. But Spider-Man was the one where it's like, oh my god, we can actually do comic booky stuff. We don't have to disguise it. Blade is basically a 90s horror action movie, and it's great. I love the first Blade. I love the second Blade. First two X-Men movies are high concept science fiction movies, which is a great fit for the X-Men. As you mentioned, the costumes are very much modeled on the Matrix. But Spider-Man feels like the first proper modern superhero movie. From that you get Daredevil, from that you get Elektra, from that you get the Fantastic Four, from that you get Ang Lee's Hulk. They should have brought back Ang Lee's Hulk. Ah. Well, maybe they did. We don't know which Hulk it was. <laughs> I think it's Norton's. I think they said it's the CGI model of Norton's. Okay, fair enough. I would love if it was just an existential meditation on fathers and sons in the final act of the movie. And then he fights Wolverine. Yeah. <laughs> Because that's what we want to see, and we want rest until we do. Boring hot take. The okra costume looks much better than the yellow costume. <laughs> Although that one never existed. That was all CGI, is it? That was a motion capture suit that they repainted effectively, wasn't it? The cowl at the climax of this movie doesn't exist either. It's entirely CGI. And I'm not going to say that that was a bad idea, but I do think that was a bad idea. <laughs> but yeah, so I spent my weekend, well, some of my weekend, I watched Spider-Man 2002, then I watched Fantastic Four, then I watched Rise of the Silver Surfer. And one thing that really stood out to me about them, and it's something that I've known anyway, but there's clear craft on display in those movies. Yeah. In the way that you don't get with a lot of modern MCU stuff. The MCU aesthetic seems to be green screen, well, fix screen and post. whatever you use, sludge. You look at this poorly lit, pixelated third act and no one's even in the same room as each other. And they probably came up with this five minutes before the film was released. But then you look at those films for the choices that were made. And there are some questionable ones in the Fantastic Four movies, Big Cloud Galactus or Doctor Doom, just in general. It's a character they can't ever seem to get right. Luckily, Craig, they have finally cracked that <laughs> egg. <laughs> yeah, apparently. But there is definite craft on display. And I imagine if I watched Electra, I would feel the same thing. What's physical spaces sets? It's a thing like watching a bad movie from the 90s. Because of the way that those movies were shot on film, they had to be lit properly. Sorry, that's very dismissive of me. But they had to be lit carefully, is how I would say that. So every shot tends to look good and crisp and clear. Whereas now, if you're shooting on digital, you can just keep shooting, and you can shoot in any conditions. You don't have to have the right light. And so it doesn't look as good. Back in the old days, you had to build a set. You had to build props. So you had to think carefully about what things look like and what their spatial relationship was to one another and actors were sharing the physical space with the objects with which they're interacting. Whereas now you just layer all that in via CGI, so it doesn't have the same tactility, mass, or spatial awareness that you associate with those old movies. I absolutely 110% get this. What I do find really frustrating is Deadpool and Wolverine shot on location, and they actually built props and sets. So things like the Fantastic Hour is a prop. Things like the 20th Century Fox logo that Deadpool gets knocked against, which is a nice little sight gag. That was physically built for that. On screen for about 20 seconds or something? On screen for about 20 seconds, but like a wonderful gag, a wonderful touch. But the movie just looks like those Marvel movies. I want to be clear here, Sean Levy said there were no reshoots on this, it came in on time and on budget because he's a reliable workman-like director to his credit, but there are elements of this that feel so disconnected from one another that they feel like other Marvel elements. So I'm thinking like the Vanessa subplot, where in Deadpool 2, Vanessa is dead for most of the movie and Deadpool goes and visits her in this kind of spiritual heaven, which is like the apartment that they share together. It's a nice gimmick to have Marina Baccarat on the same set for a couple of days while she's off doing Homeland or whatever it was she was doing around the same time. Gotham probably it would have been at that time. Whereas here it's we got her on a kitchen set but it's not their kitchen set but it's not the same apartment that they used <laughs> to live in but it's also not the apartment that they currently live in. Well he blew that one up to be fair or did he? I don't know what timeline actually asserted itself. <laughs> Yeah, but it's also clearly not the apartment that they're having the party in as well. And I get the logic of it is, okay, well, maybe it's the apartment that they had together before they broke up and he moved out or whatever. But it's weirdly disconcerting because it's the same angle and the same set and the same props. And it only appears in those flashbacks, which are the only scenes in which she appears, aside from the party scenes, which gives you the disconcerting effect of it feeling like a reshoot, even though it probably wasn't, because that's just how we make movies now. <laughs> it's fascinating. 
appreciating how this should ostensibly be a flashback and a celebration of the tactility of those movies, but it feels like it's lost in that kind of digital color corrected void that a lot of the Marvel movies are, where they go to the void and Deadpool evokes Furiosa by name, which is frustrating on a number of levels, most obviously the fact that it made more than Furiosa in its first two days of release, but also in the fact that Furiosa, despite obviously involving lots of CGI, still feels more vivid and tactile and cartoonish and lively than this does. When they're driving through the void, they're just driving through a desert, then they're driving through some corn, then they're driving through Canada, (laughs) and it just doesn't look good or interesting. Even on Loki, the void kind of looked cooler than it does here. Although I think this looks a lot better than a lot more recent Marvel movies as well. I think there was maybe some post-production excess that didn't need to be there, but Broadly speaking, I think it looks like they are in physical spaces, interacting with physical objects. Yes, obviously Jackman and Reynolds were on set for all the time together. Yeah, and you'll have some stunt guy in the Deadpool suit occasionally, most likely when he's interacting with Wesley Snipes, because they hate each other, apparently, even still. Even though there was a picture released online, I think, of them just on set doing selfies. But the joke was made, I don't like you, you never did. You never liked me. Again, this is the weird thing about this movie, where you not only have to know the comic book continuity, but you also have to know the development history. The joke is that it's the first movie where aborted Fox Project's Wikipedia page is a required source, but you also need to know about the personal lives of the people making it as well. And I know that there's a certain element of the jokes go quickly enough that they don't linger on them, and you don't feel left out by it. But I'm just wondering, if I showed this to my parents, and... My parents watched the previous two Deadpool movies. And the thing about the previous two Deadpool movies is they are similarly ironic and self-aware, but they use that irony and self-awareness to basically mask very classic, very 80s narratives. So in the first movie, he was left for dead by a bunch of mercenaries and now he's got to rescue his wife. That's a Schwarzenegger plot. You make that in the 1980s and it's a Schwarzenegger plot right down to the climax, which is in an old decommissioned aircraft carrier, except now it's a helicarrier. The second movie is basically David Leach does Terminator 2, which is exactly what David Leach was always going to do based on the fall guy bullet train and atomic blonde. It's a recognizable story about this idea of saving a child and finding a family and like dealing with is your future predetermined and set in stone. And then you get to Deadpool and Wolverine and it's chock full of did you know that Ryan Reynolds and Wesley Snipes hated each other's guts when they made Blade Trinity which is a different superhero movie in which Ryan Reynolds played a different superhero character all those years ago. There is a point where it just kind of compounds and I'm like I don't know what the accessibility is for this and obviously based on the billion dollars the accessibility is more people than I think but it's it's a very strange experience to watch and be like my 60 year old parents who watched Endgame and afterwards asked me where Batman was how are they gonna feel about this movie well I think this gives you enough different types of jokes that even if you don't get one there's another one along in five seconds it's that sequence as well where you're juggling the jokes about the never was Channing Tatum's Gambit the once was Blade the once was Electra though they don't really do much with that and you have Deadpool mocking them for what you can see as well. So the, oh, your superpowers close up magic. We're not totally fucked at all. And then our friend Johnny went into the void a couple of days ago and we haven't seen him since. And he's like, oh, that's so sad. Because you know what happened to Johnny yeah. earlier in the movie. That kind of stuff. I think there's probably just enough of an onslaught of jokes. It's a bit like airplane. If you don't find one thing funny, don't worry, wait 10 seconds and you'll yeah. probably laugh at the next thing that you notice. So I think the onslaught works in its favour. And obviously I do get all those jokes. So I did find them intermittently funny. Although I did find myself lifted out slightly during the Wesley Snipes thing thinking well, how did they get them in the same room for this then <laughs> is it still the case have they buried the hatchet <laughs> into each other's bodies. Is that a stunt guy on set wearing the Deadpool suit because Ryan Reynolds can't be in the same room as this guy and now they've released selfies, so who knows? I imagine Wesley Snipes' tax debt probably leads to a lot of forgiveness. Yeah. Well, they joke about their retirement. Yeah, oh yeah. They make the same joke in The Expendables where it's like, why did you go to prison tax evasion? Yeah. That was, again, a bit of a meta gag, but you could believe, I suppose, that a mercenary could go to <laughs> prison for tax evasion. Yeah, so, so none of that really bothered me as such. And I think most of the audience that don't understand the meta stuff will just move on to the next thing. When I went to see it the first day that I saw it, there's people that I bump into at the cinema quite often during opening night stuff. And one of the guys was explaining to his girlfriend after the film the significance of Chris Evans playing Johnny Storm. But she also just found his appearance funny enough by itself. 
Okay. Because of the way he's killed and things like that. So again, it's, okay, you get the meta gag of, we're expecting him to be Captain America. And that, that is a bit of a joke in itself. We're expecting him to be Captain yeah. America. Underneath his cloak, you can see the blue costume. You're waiting for it. And then he says something else. And even if you don't know who Captain America is, you know that Wade is very fanboyish over someone that looks like this guy. Yeah. Because you see it earlier in the film. So I think it internally works by itself. But yeah, Chris Evans' appearance. I've seen evidence of the fact that someone just found that funny by itself without understanding the reference. So I think your general audience, and I always talk about this mythical general audience member, this person that doesn't know anything, that doesn't live online, that hasn't seen all of this stuff, who's expected to just follow it through, just media anchorage alone. And I think this film does enough to just keep you going, even if you don't get all the meta stuff. And I think if it was a constant onslaught of fourth wall breaking and meta gags and poking fun at its own fractured timelines and poking fun at the X-Men stuff and whatever, it would be inaccessible. But I think it just manages to just be funny enough by itself that it doesn't get buried under all that. Because there's plenty of jokes that I can think of that just have nothing to do with anything outside this film, actually. And I'm not going to quote any of them yet. <laughs> You're saving them. That's always the worry with doing a Deadpool podcast is, are we just, just going to repeating yourself. the jokes? And that's why there isn't a podcast on Neil Before Pod for one and two, because that's largely all it would have been beyond some observations about what it says about family and relationships and all this stuff. The inherent 80s-ness of it. Yeah. So I think it works in that respect. We should talk a bit about characters, though. Wade is always an interesting one, the lead, or the co-lead in this case, because on paper, he should be a very difficult character to invest in, because he's obscenely violent, he's amoral, he says he's morally flexible, but I think... Reynolds and his writers understand the character enough that they can keep you in involved in what he wants to achieve without ever crossing that line to him just being obnoxious all the time. It's a tough line to walk and I think they deserve credit for doing that well in all three films because I've read comics where he's not written well and he's just contemptible. I just hate the guy. But I think this is a good adaptation of Deadpool. I think it's a defining adaptation of Deadpool. I think everything's going to live in the shadow of this, much like Wolverine as Hugh Jackman. I think that the key that they stumble onto with the first two is that with the layer of self-aware irony, the key is to turn him into an 80s action hero where if you watch a Stallone and Schwarzenegger movie, you describe them as violent and amoral, yet that is exactly what the default Stallone Lone and Schwarzenegger action hero is, where it's just like, do they want to kill this person? Yes. Then this person is dying. <laughs> Any level of force necessary to accomplish that goal is required. And you may get some backstory, again, to, to reference the first Deadpool movies, about dead wives or kidnapped wives that serve as motivation and serve to excuse the gratuitous levels of violence on display. But most of the time, it's just, no, these people want to hurt people and it's going to be enjoyable for you as an audience to watch them. And I think Reynolds and Reese and Wernick kind of zone in on that and understand that that logic kind of works. Now, to be fair, they are also very careful about the jokes they do make. They're very careful about how Wade is basically positioned. In the very first film, he's introduced protecting a girl from a stalker, which shows he has a heart of gold underneath it all. It's a nice way to get the audience on side with him. With regards to this movie, it's a weird thing after having Vanessa getting fridged in Deadpool 2 and then the fridging being undone at the end of Deadpool 2. I think that was a somewhat lazy plot device, but at least it worked. At least it accomplished what it was meant to do. You can point to it and go, in the style of 80s action movies, this is outdated. Surely we are better at writing female characters now than we were 40 years ago. It's almost the thing about acknowledging this is problematic doesn't make it less problematic. Yeah, it lets you get away with it. This is the thing with the Deadpool movies where ironically pointing stuff out often serves as a way to excuse doing it. I have more tolerance for that when it's a genre or a pastiche than when it's just lazy writing and plot holes. And I think that with this movie, I don't really buy the whole... Deadpool wants to be accepted and wants to belong as a narrative. I don't buy that as the driving force of the character. Again, this is the thing where you can feel the Disney-esque breathing down the back of the movie's neck, where it's, okay, you get to talk about cocaine and you get to talk about pegging, but let's be 110% clear. You do not, unlike the previous Deadpool movies, get to show pegging. You do not get to show cocaine. <laughs> and you're also, to be clear, you make all the jokes you want about the X-Men movies, but we absolutely need to be 110% clear the MCU is cool and the MCU is great and Wade absolutely wants to be part of this team and when he finds his place at the end Happy Hogan gives him the speech to find the right level the movie does nothing to dispute the idea that Deadpool is on a lower level than the MCU you think at the end it's gonna be well Deadpool will figure out that he is just as good on his own he doesn't need the MCU and that he can be just as important as they are but the actual moral is he doesn't need to be in the MCU 
MCU, but he also needs to understand the MCU is still the most important universe in terms of continuity. Think about Deadpool 2. And think about the scene in the X-Mansion in Deadpool 2. Colossus takes him there after Vanessa's death after a suicide attempt. And Colossus tries to turn him into an X-Man. And you get this steady string of jokes, first of all, about can't the studio throw us a bone? Making fun of the fact that Fox couldn't be bothered to have the cameos while having the cameos behind them, which is a nice gag. Having him ride around in Charles Xavier's wheelchair. So many old white guys on the wall. I should have brought my rape whistle. Having him show up at a crime scene and go, watch out, it's the X-Men, a dated metaphor for racism them in the 60s. <laughs> all those jokes are, first of all, they're good. Second of all, they're affectionate. And third of all, they're entirely on point. But here it's no, Wade completely unironically wants to be in the Avengers. And while Wade learns that he has his own place that is lower than the Avengers, he certainly never learns to fuck the Avengers or that the Avengers don't matter or the Avengers don't match his style or the Avengers are a little bit nerdy or the Avengers are the best kids at school. No, we're going to play Avengers clips and people's eyes are going to well up. Why is Thor crying over me? We're going to salute Captain America. I don't know. I think the deference that this movie requires of Wade towards the existence of the MCU feels at odds with the, and I, I mean this affectionately, liking the previous two Deadpool movies, but the kind of juvenile adolescence kind of irreverence, the what are you rebelling against, what you got kind of attitude that I associate with the first two. Yeah, and I do think there is a bit of a repetition to his arc from the second film in this. as Losing Vanessa and getting Vanessa back. Yeah, it's also finding his F word, finding his family and then... <laughs> yeah. In this, he acknowledges that he's found his family and he wants to protect them, but it seems that he already found his place and he wants to go to another place. They don't really establish why he wants to move to the Avengers. He wants to be a part of that. Or how? I can't remember when is the lowest form of conversation. This is the lowest form of criticism. But the question of he travels back in time, he undoes all the stuff at the end of Deadpool 2. How does he end up in the sacred timeline? And if he ends up in the sacred timeline, why does he need the TVA to move him there? Why can't he just move all his family and everybody he cares about over to there without having to do any of the anchor being sort of nonsense involving Wolverine? He only has one watch. <laughs> you were so abusive. We've just turned this into quoting Deadpool and Wolverine. <laughs> How does he end up in that timeline? I don't know. He just does. Yeah, he just does, because we need that scene. If anything, that's the most consistent thing about X-Men movies. <laughs> the fact that none of it hangs together and makes sense. We're supposed to believe that the first two Deadpool movies and this one are set in the same universe as Logan, even though they can't be. Concurrent with Logan as well. Not just set in the same universe, but set in the same time, presumably. <laughs> even though Logan is a decaying world takes place in 2029 or whatever 2049 yeah it's a decaying world where mutants are all dead and everything's grim and people are eating cornstarch or whatever it is i don't know that's killing them that richard e grant is growing yeah yeah it's a very bleak timeline but that's just on the southern border up in new york it's it's all hip and happening <laughs> but again x-men movies not making sense compared to the last one is pretty much par for the course isn't it it became that way i don't know when it started really from x3 really is probably the point where it really begins where you have that clean break between the two of them yeah well x-men origins wolverine is clearly a new yes. continuity and then you get first class which is technically a reboot but ends up being a prequel it's, it's intended as a prequel ends up being a reboot i consider a reboot and then you have the days of future past stuff which tries to turn into a prequel. It's a prequel, but also it's a new timeline where the events played out somewhat similarly. So you get <laughs> references to the old X-Men timeline, but Patrick Stewart talks about Raven and I grew up together, which obviously they didn't do in the original timeline because... They never referenced, yeah. He doesn't react to Mystique in any way, and the Magneto helmet is a new thing to him in the yeah. first X-Men, and so on. There's all these continuity issues. So the fact that there's a continuity issue there, I'm okay with that. I don't know if it's a deliberate reference, but it's a reference. Yeah, none of it makes sense. We just needed an excuse to... To have that scene. ...kickstart this plot and have Logan be part of it and acknowledge the fact that, hang on, aren't we sullying Logan's death here? And the answer is, yes, we are. We're going to literally beat people with this corpse. Which I don't mind. I actually really like that opening scene as a declaration of intent. And again, that's the irreverent, juvenile, Wade Wilson, Deadpool sense of humour, which I quite enjoyed about the first movies. The problem is that you can see the tension there, what we're allowed to joke about and what we're not allowed to joke about. We're allowed to joke about the Fox movies, so we can literally desecrate Wolverine's corpse. But we can't joke about the Marvel stuff, so we can't do the opening credits gag like we did with Deadpool and Deadpool 2, where Deadpool's directed by an overpaid hack and Deadpool 2 is directed by the guy 
guy who killed the dog in John Wick. Whereas this one has to be a Kevin Feige production, a Sean Levy film. It's a very strange and disconcerting kind of approach, particularly because it would actually be pretty funny to go directed by the guy who made Three Nights at the Museum movies over whatever it is Wade Wilson's doing with Wolverine's corpse at that moment. And Real Steel brackets, which is good, actually. Real Steel is really good. Really good. It's his best film, I think. Sean Levy's best film. Easily. Is it Levy or Levy? Whenever he was announced as the director of this, I was sceptical, but I was also like, he worked with Jackman on Real Steel. Maybe there is something there. I think he did a good job. I Maybe when we talk about some of the action scenes, if you have a big one or action scene and you have to cut Madonna's Like a Prayer as viciously as you do to get that to work, I have some questions. We'll get to it. In terms of Wade's characterization, so he is essentially going through the same arc he did in the last film with some modifications. Right down to having a grumpy sidekick who wants to murder him from another timeline. Yeah, and making that noble sacrifice at the end as well. He does that again, which he did in the last one. And also Guardians of the Galaxy this time, for some reason. Yeah. It's fairly standard. I think it works, though, for the most part. And I'm still invested in, in the Ryan Reynolds Deadpool of it all. And I like the approach of, it's a novel thing, but it's the idea he's in costume for most of it. He rarely takes off the mask. It's almost like he takes off the mask when there's about to be some feels, even though he's still in the heavy, disfigured makeup. But still, he's able to create some kind of emotional thing. I don't know if the makeup's quite as harsh as it was in the other two movies. I feel like it's maybe softened a bit. Well, he also gets to play nice pool this time as well to be fair keep his face yeah. I can gently strike the fourth wall too the proposal <laughs> is that what you think I do what the f- <laughs> I feel like again this is a point of contention between yourself and myself Greg I obviously love superhero comics and superhero costumes are great the issue is one of the big things about live action movies is it's great to have actors who can give facial expressions yeah but it became t- the point of parody in the Spider-Man <laughs> movies didn't it yeah taking the final the fight the mask will be torn that's it you have those big Tobey Maguire eyes you want to see him in action the thing with Reynolds in particular is when he's wearing the mask it could be anyone under there so I think of the opening sequence where they're doing the bye 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 and sync stuff he has a dance double for that who's wearing the Deadpool uniform and that's great dance doubles great but i think of say tom cruise at the climax of tropic thunder where even under heavy makeup it is very obvious that that is tom cruise and watching tom cruise dance over the credits of tropic thunder is just delightful because it's tom cruise and seeing an actor do something that is so potentially embarrassing walking that tightrope of potential public humiliation is kind of endearing you don't have that when he's wearing the mask because If Ryan Reynolds had learned the choreography to Bye Bye Bye, and even if it wasn't pitch perfect, even if he wasn't a Broadway-esque dancer, there would still be something charming about watching Ryan Reynolds wearing a Deadpool costume, or most of a Deadpool costume, doing the Bye 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 dance. But because he's wearing the mask, I don't feel it, I don't buy into it. It's weird. And again, the Wolverine costume, where the yellow costume is iconic, it works in animation, it works in comics, don't know that it works in live action, don't know that this one works in live action. But the climax of this movie, where he's wearing the cowl with the white lenses, and Maybe it's the fact that it's CGI that really does it, but you're losing Jackman's eyes when he's emoting, when they're doing the Star Trek 2 goodbye. Wade, you stupid fuck! That scene maybe, maybe, maybe would work for me emotionally if I could see the eyes of the two actors trying to communicate this to one another. And I, I'm watching their masked phases and I'm like I don't know that I do may have any connection to this and again obviously it's because live action and comics are different in comics famously you can move the eyes on the mask because it's a comic book well they do that here too well they do that with Spider-Man and the MCU as well to be fair they allow the eyes to move the mechanical eyes yeah whereas yeah. Deadpool it just happens yeah and they don't bother explaining why it just does this is a I fear a point of contention between yourself and myself well I think the Deadpool mask and the Deadpool costume is expressive enough that It does fill in some of those gaps. And that moment you were talking about where there was that emotional beat where the the sacrifice was about to happen, it did actually grab me emotionally seeing the the two of them. And the moment before it as well, where Deadpool was like, it's got to be me. I've dragged you into this. I've got to be this one to sacrifice. And Logan's like, nope, you've got your family. I've got nothing. So I'm going to do this. Let me do this. And I really bought into that. And I think that's a testament to Hugh Jackman's ability. And I didn't know the cowl was all... CGI. I thought there might have been at least a physical one at some point. Well, there might have been a physical one on set. I know famously, or not famously, I say that famously, something I've heard. But I think in interviews they talked about when they were doing on the backlot set in open air, in case of publicity, that CGI because they didn't want that leaking. Which is insane, because he's wearing the yellow costume. (laughs) It's such a weird thing to get so obsessed about money shots over. Part of me also suspects it's one of those things where they were trying to figure out how to make it look like we talked about, that basic logic of modern filmmaking, where if you don't know what it looks like while you're filming, you can quote unquote figure it out in post. (laughs) 
that does look like a mask that was tough to, quote, figure out. The first time I watched it, I did wonder where the cowl came from when he lifted yeah, it behind the his back head, of his yeah. neck. I've not seen this on the back of his neck this entire time. There's been no sense that it's there. And those fins look pretty hard. They don't look like they're bending or folding. I'm thinking back to, say, the CW Flash, where they always did this thing whenever Barry was going to take his mask off. He would put his hands to his face, they would cut away, they would cut back and the mask would be off. And it was just the way they did it, because it's a piece they have to build them into, I guess. They can't show them unmasking. And in Spider-Man, they always got around it a little bit as well. Was there not like a shell over the face of... Yeah. whoever was wearing the costume to get the shape of the Spider-Man face. I know when the mask came off, it was always CGI. There would be a shot of their face and they would move their fist and the mask would come off, but the mask would be CGI. Because you have that plastic shell or whatever it is yeah. underneath the mask to get the shape of the face. Otherwise, it just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't look like that at all. Yeah, again, movie magic. We tape a bunch of cats together. Practical considerations, these kinds of things, yeah. And that, that would bring us on neatly to Logan. I like the idea of introducing a version of Logan that is just the biggest loser in his universe and building it from there. And it's almost like he's in the shadow of the Logan film. They make it clear it's not the same guy. And, well, the Logan in the Logan film isn't the same guy that we were watching at the other X-Men movies either. This is the thing. When we talk about this, the default assumption is to go, no, 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 you don't understand. It's a different continuity. It's a different character. Therefore, it doesn't matter. I think, and to be clear, I'm not somebody who thinks that Logan is quote-unquote devalued or degraded by this. I don't think it's diminished in any way, shape, or form. Logan is its own film. I don't think so at all, no. It's still there. That's it exactly. You can go back and watch Logan any time. Well, my Blu-ray is still there. I checked. No more than the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies are denigrated by Spider-Man 3 if we're being flippant, but Madam Web if we're not. That's not the complaint I'm about to make, and I feel the need to foreground that before I make it. But this really does feel like the poor yellow label equivalent version of Logan. You said that idea of this is an infamous loser, a failure of a Logan of a Wolverine. That's the entire starting point of Logan as well, is that Logan has failed and he's embarrassed and he's a loser and the X-Men have faded into history. They're all dead. He's no longer holding up the ideals of Charles's school. He's falling apart. He's accomplished absolutely nothing. The future that he's promised has never actually arrived. And you say that they do try to distinguish between this version, the version from Logan. They do and they don't. First of all, Wolverine played by Hugh Jackman is always going to be its own thing. Comic book realities don't work in film in the way that they work in comic books because comic books are drawn by different artists. The faces of particular characters do change over time as they're drawn by different artists. And you see the comic accurate Wolverine in this and how ridiculous that would be. Yeah, the little short stuff. They should have got Danny DeVito for that, to be fair. (laughs) But played by a particular actor has a particular meaning. When the audience sees Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, they bring all the memories of all the different Wolverines that Hugh Jackman has played. You have the Henry Cavill Wolverine. If this movie were about Wade and Henry Cavill's Wolverine, it would not be the same movie. It would not have the same emotional weight to it. It would, I dare say, not make a billion dollars as much as we all love Henry Cavill. They're also not going to cast a 40-year-old as their new movie <laughs> yeah, because they want them for 20 years, don't they? Yeah, and the movie knows this because there's the moment where Cassandra touches this Logan's mind and it plays flashbacks from Logan. Even though we know that this isn't the Logan from Logan, it plays a greatest hits reel of the hotel attack, the confrontation, I think, with the limo and stuff like that, the bit in the woods, all that stuff comes from Logan. So even though this Logan has not lived through those events exactly, the film is drawing on the audience's association with Logan in order to get us to emotionally invest in it. And when you're doing that, and I want to be clear, my argument is not that Logan is diminished or devalued by this in any way, shape or form. My issue with it is very simple. It's I have just watched a movie that did pretty much this exact same arc with this exact same character with this exact same actor and did it so, so so much better. There's a wonderful quote from, is it Sidan Tatlaka, who wrote a Joy Sauce, I think, about it. This is filmmaking by inference, where we're told that this Wolverine is a failure. We're told that this Wolverine has embarrassed his X-Men. We're told that this Wolverine failed his Chuck. We're told that this Wolverine found the bodies of his friends. But we don't actually see any of that. And I know in Logan, we don't actually see Charles's stroke kill the X-Men. But we live in it because we live in the ruins of it. And we see the relationship between Logan and Charles. And we see Wolverine dealing with this sense of failure. We see him living in the world that he's living in. And here... 
he just tells us all this stuff through exposition. We don't see any flashbacks. We don't spend any time. We're just kind of told secondhand, arguably firsthand, I guess, that this is what happened. And it just reminds me of how empty this all feels emotionally. A bunch of humans showed up and killed the X-Men. And so Wolverine killed all of them. And then he apparently killed some other people as well. Although we're kind of cagey on that. We're not going to get too specific about the people that he killed. Did he kill women and children? Did he kill relatives and family members? Did he just kill random strangers in the street? No need to ask any questions whatsoever. He's introduced at the bar and he's like, you're not welcome here. You're not welcome anywhere. That makes it sound like he did some sort of public humiliation. Like, I don't know. A star is born. He wet himself on stage. And now everybody in the universe is greatly embarrassed for him. And you get to the climax and it's like, no, he massacred presumably dozens, if not hundreds of people. And it's not only is he not welcome here, why are there not cops coming to here to try and arrest him based on the narrative we've told? And it's because the way that his backstory is offered to the audience in this movie, you're meant to go, oh, it's Logan. It's basically Logan. Some of the details have shifted slightly, but we know that this version of Logan is the product of a bunch of dead X-Men who feels a sense of shame about letting the team down, but isn't directly responsible for their death, who has killed lots of people and feels kind of guilty about it, but not really. It feels, and this is arguably one of the quote-unquote problems with multiversal storytelling. And again, need to be clear here, need to give credit to Marvel where credit's due, because I've been very harsh, I will continue to be very harsh. But people talk about the multiverse, and there's a joke in here about can we quit it with the multiverse stuff? If you look at just the numbers, the multiverse stuff is the stuff that is really clicking. As tired, Craig, as you and I might be of the multiverse, as exhausted as we might be of the multiverse. What is the most watched Marvel Disney Plus show? It's not WandaVision. It's Loki. What was the first Marvel Studios affiliated project to gross over a billion dollars after Endgame? Well, actually, it was Far From Home, but that's kind of a multiversal movie. But after that, it was No Way Home, which is definitely a multiversal movie. What is the highest grossing Marvel movie between Endgame and Deadpool and Wolverine? Oh, it's Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Even if you step outside of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you look at things like, say, Across the Spider-Verse and Into the Spider-Verse as two of the most successful critical and commercial successes when it comes to superhero cinema. So the multiverse as a concept, as skeptical as people might be about it, and as justified as we might be about it, it is incredibly commercially lucrative if you're just looking at the spreadsheets of it. But it does mean that you get to take shortcuts. So I am watching this and I'm wondering, I emotionally invested in the arc in Logan. I cared about the arc in Logan because Logan sold me on the arc. I got to see what it was like to live with a, a Logan who was an infamous loser, who had failed his friends, who was waking up every day in the shadow of that failure. And here in this movie, it feels like they just try to do a shortcut by going, hey, you've seen Logan, right? You get it. And it's like, wait, is this Logan? No, 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 not Logan. Different Logan. But you've seen Logan, right? And I'm like, yeah, well, same deal. Yeah, okay, so same character. No, 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 not same character, same deal. So you know how you care about Logan? Yeah, I really like the Logan from Logan. Is that this guy? No, 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 not this guy. But we want you to feel about this guy the same way you feel about that guy, who's a totally different guy. Again, this is the thing where I worry about me being maybe cynical, but my brain is like, in order to get to the place that this movie wants me to get emotionally with this character, I have to do several levels of contortions and midair backflips in order to land where this movie is expecting me to. That's my thing. And I say that loving Jackman as Wolverine, to be clear. You talk about movie magic, actually, because on some subconscious level, I was aware of the similarities to Logan, but I didn't think about it while I was watching it. I was actually invested enough in this version of Wolverine, whether that's down to Jackman's performance or the way that he's written in this film or a combination of both. I don't know. But when I was watching it at the time, I was actually invested in what he was trying to achieve. And then the comparison didn't really stand out to me. I was invested in the Logan arc as well in Logan. I I still think Logan is one of the best comic book movies ever made. It definitely yeah. is. But also, like you said, it, this film doesn't diminish it in any no. way. And maybe they're cheating a bit by copying that template to some degree, but trying to build it around a Deadpool story. But I like the idea that they were both kind of seeking purpose and that's what linked them. The idea that in his case, he wanted to atone or redeem himself and then ultimately realizing that wasn't possible, but he gets to move on from it. And Wolverine's lived a long time. He has to move on from a lot. He has to keep moving. Otherwise, he would go insane. And I think it helps that his memory erases every few <laughs> decades, doesn't it? In the comics, it's explained that his healing factor is what he gets rid of his memories, isn't it? Yeah. Other than the movies, it's, well, shoot him in the head with an adamantium bullet and that'll somehow erase his memories. Don't think about it. But they do also bring them back in House of M. I think one of the things is Bendis at the end of that resets it so he remembers everything. 
Yeah, well, that's what starts to undo House of M, isn't it? Because Wolverine remembers everything, yeah. absolutely everything. But the idea is he deals with a lot of trauma over his very, very long life and then he has to move on from it, otherwise he wouldn't be able to move forward. And Logan is a tank. He moves forward, he takes the... The scratches, he takes the damage and he keeps going. That's what he does. Very Rocky Balboa and you keep moving forward. <laughs> it ain't about how hard you hit or stab. It's about how hard you can keep yeah. getting hit or getting stabbed and keep moving forward. Yeah, exactly. And I think the best actual visual representation of that was in The Wolverine where he's got a bunch of arrows with ropes. Oh, the arrows. Yeah. And he's just dragging. Yeah. That is a movie that is very flawed, but is fascinating. I have a great deal of affection for The Wolverine. Yeah, the first two thirds of The Wolverine are great, and then yeah. it becomes a MCU third act CGI mess. Yeah, it does feel like a rough draft for Logan. We're talking about celebrating movies that are primordial, evolutionary kind of soup for modern superhero movies. You can see Wolverine is a rough draft. It's maybe 10 degrees off Logan, but those 10 degrees make all the difference. Just on the Hugh Jackman thing, and again, this is a point of divergence between myself and yourself. Well, that's what's good. We're exploring it. We're in the Honda. We're about to just have a knockdown brawl. (laughs) Again, my cynical brain in my cynical head, I'm willing to accept, Craig, that I am the problem here, even before I voice this objection. But the yellow costume, thematically, what does the yellow costume represent? Does he wear the yellow costume to atone for his sins and his perceived failures of the X-Men? In which case, he should wear the costume for the entirety of the movie and take it off at the end because he is finally freed of the guilt and the shame. Or does he wear the costume because he wants to be worthy of the X-Men, to be the superhero that Charles always knew that he was, but never really felt like he was himself and certainly doesn't feel like now? Does he feel ashamed of failing the X-Men? And does he feel like he's not worthy of wearing the X-Men costume and carrying on the brand? In which case, the arc would be he doesn't wear the costume and then puts it on the third act and shows up and finally is an X-Men. And it really feels like, for me, the movie's like, no, 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 no. He's got to wear the costume for the whole movie and continue wearing the costume after the movie movie because people like the yellow costume <laughs> he's wolverine he's got to wear the yellow costume what are you doing well, he about? kind of does take it off at the end when it explodes off him <laughs> i mean he's still wearing the pants and the top of it to be fair yeah that is a nice reveal of his and he gives the cowl away as well he gives it to that tva mook no he takes it back he does but he gives it away i wonder if that was a later decision but it just seemed like yeah, i don't need this anymore you can have it because the closing shot in the movie is obviously the two masks together again this is my cynical brain where i'm like was the calculus here the fans have been complaining about him not wearing a comic accurate uniform for decades <laughs> so he's gonna wear nothing but that for the entirety of this movie that didn't take 20 <laughs> fucking years. years yeah yeah i agree the costume what it represents. I do like that it represents he's wearing his failure. The idea of if I'd just worn this costume and stayed at home, they wouldn't be dead. Also, that's a hell of a thing to put on you, by the way, just in terms of (laughs) I went out for a beer and my friends all died. And the important thing I learned was that I need to be an X-Man for life. Dude, you could have been on the X-Men and just taken a break and gone for a beer. It doesn't take that long to murder. To be clear, I should say I'm not talking from experience, but I imagine it doesn't take that long to murder a school full of people. (laughs) I could leave my house and go out and have a nice dinner with somebody and my house could burn down and I come back and my house would be ashes and for me to take from that well the key thing here is that I was never really a owner of this house I was never really part of this household (laughs) that's the thing where it just feels like a pencil sketch of something as opposed to a fully developed idea for me I guess the implication is he ran out after a major argument or something yeah I found myself thinking about one of the early episodes of the 92 X-Men cartoon where Cyclops is giving Wolverine orders and he says, I go where I want to go. And then it turns out where he wants to go is where they're going later in the episodes. (laughs) He's the high school jock, isn't he? It's the idea of, yeah, I do whatever I want. It just happens to be this. Yeah, I don't need you guys, but where are you guys going? Just so you know, I'm here because I want to be here, not because you asked me. That's important to me to know this. We're both here for two entirely separate reasons that just happen to take us to the same place at the same time. Don't ask any questions. (laughs) I'm not doing it because you asked me to. I'm doing it because I want to. Yeah, so I think they could have done a bit more with the background to show us that loss and show us what caused that loss. And Maybe it was a case of they couldn't get James Marsden and Halle Berry and so on or didn't bother asking them. 
But also, maybe it would have ruined the tone of your orator road trip comedy. Because it's very much like the humans came and killed them. Oh, is this going to be a story about prejudice against mutants? Because even Deadpool 2 is a fairly decent movie about the mutant metaphor, where it's used as a metaphor for things like conversion therapy. But it's, you have this goofy road trip movie, which is about intellectual property. And then Wolverine's like, oh, and by the way, all my friends died in a hate crime. Maybe you can't really squeeze that into the third act of your movie. <laughs> yeah, it's messy. But I think Jackman totally sells it. Oh, Jackman's great. And I actually think he's never been more ferocious in this Ooh. role as well. I think he's more unhinged than we've ever seen him. Perhaps the exception to that would maybe be the X-Men Origins Wolverine PS3 tie-in game, <laughs> where he's definitely playing comic book Wolverine. That's the first time Hugh Jackman played R-rated Wolverine. Okay. He doesn't swear, I don't think, but he's unhinged. And I don't think he's ever been unhinged in the way that he is here in any of the PG-13, except for the last one and for the DVD release of The Wolverine as well, because that was R-rated, that version of it. Interesting. For me, the moments that come close to working with Jackman are just the moments with Reynolds, where it is the annoying road trip comedy, and you can tell that Jackman and Reynolds really like each other and enjoy spending time together. Like the moment where they're in the car before the fight. I'm not usually fond of the weird, we talk about 80s movies tropes, the no homo homoeroticism of what if they fight in the car, but it's like sex but also no homo. They have the bit where he punches the roof of the car in frustration and he's just yelling at Reynolds and yelling at Deadpool. Those are the moments for me where I'm like, okay, I understand why Jackman wanted to make this movie. I honestly buy that Jackman is good friends with Reynolds and good friends with Levy and they like hanging out together and they like having scenes together. Those are the kind of moments where I was like, yeah, okay, I do enjoy spending time with this huge jacked man. That speech in the car as well, that's an all-timer, I think. Just the the absolute venom in the words that he's spewing. I think Hugh Jackman said that that was one of his favourite things, learning that speech. It's a moment for me that is an honest-to-goodness performance. I'm very cynical about this movie, but that is a moment that he is playing. And Jackman is an actor... Sorry, I feel like I'm putting a lot of the feet of this movie. Jackman is an actor who I think we failed as a culture. He arrived at just the wrong time. He's a song and dance man. He can do anything. And he's really great when you give him meaty material. I think he's phenomenal in, say, The Prestige. I think The Prestige is one of the great performances. I think he's as good in that movie as Christian Bale is. And Bale is widely regarded as one of the, quote-unquote, best actors of the 21st century. But as a culture critic, we failed you, Jackman. But I think the cultural landscape wasn't where it needed to be for Jackman to land in the way he did. I think if he'd arrived 10 minutes earlier, he would have had a much bigger, much broader career. And I think it is nice that he gets to play the drama of that, if that makes sense. Well, there was an attempt to put him in the action hero mould with things like Van Helsing, wasn't there? And then there was Australia, the Baz Luhrmann movie, which is an old-fashioned romantic epic. Greatest Showman kind of worked in the long enough term, which is what you get the sense he wanted to do his entire career. Well, Greatest Showman only happens because of the clout he gets for being Wolverine, doesn't it? Yeah. Because the musical was dead at that point, more or less. And then he never gets to do it again, <laughs> despite the fact it makes half a billion dollars very slowly. But if your introduction to Hugh Jackman is Wolverine like it was for me, then when you hear that, actually, you'd rather be on stage singing and dancing. I'm just thinking, what? This guy? You get a joke about his Music Man revival here. Yeah. I will admit I'm a little disappointed that they didn't. They play some of the greatest showman music when they jump through the hole. I'm a little disappointed they didn't let you, Jackman, do a song and dance number. That was definitely a missing point. Yeah. yeah. Or even just one of the variants at the start was singing yeah. Wolverine, something like that. Yeah. Because the idea is it's not just Wolverine we're celebrating, we're celebrating Hugh Jackman. It's as much a celebration of this man's talent talent as it is a celebration of this comic book character. It's the idea the two come together and make something special. I like the Greatest Showman bit. I like the he will perform the entire second act of Music Man with no warm up. <laughs> but I would also just like to see something like that. I'd like to actually get a chance to put him in a movie that's going to make a billion dollars that will have just a Hugh Jackman song and dance number in it because the man loves it. Maybe it'll be in the inevitable extended cut that yeah. they'll release where the opening scene is extended where he just walks into the... or The, the recruitment, the montage. Yeah, it's extended and one of them he walks into Les Mis or something. And it's like, no, not you. As cynical as I sound about nostalgia, that montage, as somebody who loves comics, seeing that is a Claremont and Lee, but that old X-Men Outback cover of Wolverine chained to the X, crucified on the X. That's cool. Seeing him wear the ochre costume fighting the Hulk. That's also cool. Seeing, as you said, comics accurate Wolverine also cool. Seeing Age of Apocalypse X-Man Wolverine, also cool. But that's the point where I'm like, okay, I'm kind of full. I don't need anything else. And the movie's like, no, 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 no. The funniest thing is that Hugh Jackman's first appearance in the film is as comic accurate Wolverine. Yeah. There's the skeleton that looks like him as well, but his actual first physical appearance is... Hopping off the bar stool. Yeah, with a clearly, I wonder if it was deliberately rush job 
<laughs> CGI shrinking. Yeah. yeah, I think the cheapness is part of the appeal. Yeah. Again, part of me is like, I do wish that they had gotten Danny DeVito. The part of me is also like, instead of Shannon Tatum, could you have done Do Grey Scott? Yeah, I wonder what was going on there. I think they missed a trick on not getting him to do it. Maybe he just didn't want to do it or wasn't yeah. asked. I don't know. It's like, oh, it's the Wolverine. No, no, it looks like you wouldn't have worked. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Maybe there is an extended version of that sequence. You did get an extended Deadpool 2. Yeah, it was largely alternate. What I remember of the Deadpool 2 and the super duper fucking cut was that it was largely alternate takes, which was interesting. Yeah, there's different line reads and yeah, different that's... lines entirely and stuff like that. But there are extended or extra yeah. scenes in there as well. There's a weird one where you introduce Fire Fist a scene earlier and it doesn't work because you're better meeting him at the point in the theatrical cut. At the school. The variant montage also sets you up for the idea of there are more than one of Wolverine, so don't worry about it. We can dredge one up from somewhere. And you talked about the multiverse of it all, where you could be convinced that there's no consequences because we can just hoover up a different guy from another universe that's exactly the same, except from the fact that they aren't dead. So we can get Tony Stark back. We just have to steal him from another universe. Fine. But I think this film does a decent enough job of what happens here makes a difference to that one. And there's that story about there's a beach full of starfish and you throw one into the ocean and it's, why did you do that? It doesn't make any difference. Well, made a difference to that one. It's the idea of the individuality of these variants. They do matter on their own. And it's up to the storyteller to make you care about that variant. The fact that Tom Holland exists doesn't diminish the fact that Andrew Garfield is also in that film and has something to say. Yeah. I do also think, though, the fact that it's Hugh Jackman as Wolverine in particular. There's a moment at the climax of this, not to jump ahead, where they give, and poor, 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 poor Matthew McFad, they give him like seven info dumps over the course of the movie. Tell us the stakes. Yeah, can you please just outline the stakes so the audience will be brought up to speed? Don't worry, we're almost finished. We're in the home stretch, I promise. But the moment where he is like, antimatter and matter will collide and you will be wiped out forever, completely death oblivion. That is an impossible thing for me to buy in a movie where the starting point of the movie is, remember how Hugh Jackman as Wolverine died at the end of the last movie? And yes, I know it's a different Wolverine, but also it was Hugh Jackman saying farewell to the character of Wolverine. You couldn't make that death stick. There is no way that I buy the emotional stakes of the scene that you're about to set to Madonna on a, like a prayer. <laughs> That's the thing with the multiverse, where I think you can do really interesting things with it. I am a big fan of Multiverse of Madness. I think Multiverse of Madness is one of the stronger Marvel movies ever made, which is a hugely controversial stance. But even outside of that, the two Spider-Man, Into the Spider-Verse, Across the Spider-Verse movies, both widely beloved, and I think are fantastic movies. I like No Way Home a bit less than most, but I do think it is a better example of this kind of movie than this or The Flash, in order to balance both Marvel and DC criticism here. And obviously, Everything Everywhere All at Once won the Oscar and was my favourite movie of was it 2021 when it came out I think whatever year it was it was my favourite movie of that particular year so I think you can do multiverse storytelling very well but I do also think when you keep using it in the way that these movies use it which is here's a thing you recognise played by a character you recognise and even if it's not exactly the same it is functionally the same again this is the thing where you can argue they're from different universes and it's a different Wolverine but also as an audience member watching a live action film starring an actor that I quite like. That difference is academic at best. The version of Axel Foley who appears in Beverly Hills Cop 2 is very different from the version of Axel Foley who appears in Beverly Hills Cop 1, but they're both called Axel Foley. They're both played by Eddie Murphy. They both have many of the same mannerisms, so it doesn't matter how different they are in terms of how they're actually written. They're going to feel like the same character to me. And the same is true here, where it doesn't matter that it's not functionally the same Wolverine from Logan. I'm going to be thinking about Logan while I watch this, and therefore it makes it harder for me to buy this as its own separate thing. And particularly because the movie leans so hard on reminding me. They say it's a different version of the Wolverine from Logan, but they bring back Daphne Keene and give Daphne Keene a scene with him in which she reminds him of the hero that he was supposed to be, which is the same arc as Logan. In Logan, you have Daphne Keene show up and tell Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, it doesn't matter if he was never actually a hero. All he needs to be is be the hero that she wants him to be, and then he will be a hero. That is exactly exactly the same arc. So that's the thing when we talk about I'm not walking on a beach and finding a bunch of different starfish. I'm walking on a beach and there's a starfish which is really cool and there's a starfish next to it saying see that starfish right there? I'm just like that starfish. I'm pretty cool. And I'm like, I don't know that you are. And it's like I'm pretty cool. As strained a metaphor or analogy as that is that's where I am with this character. It's very odd. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And like I say, the comparisons just didn't occur to me as I was watching it, which is the magic of the movie for me. I think the idea that I was able to buy 
buy into this new version of Wolverine after I'd supposedly said goodbye to the <laughs> character a few years ago. I think this works in the way that Xavier and Multiverse of Madness doesn't because there is no acknowledgement of the fact that, oh no, we did say goodbye to this character a few years ago. It's just he's there and it could be anybody. You could have any telepath. It could be Emma Frost. It doesn't matter. His presence in the film just doesn't matter. I will say as somebody who was very cynical about that multiverse of cameos in Multiverse of Madness, <laughs> as somebody who when I watched it was like, this really takes me out of the movie. I will say, was it four years, not even two years later, I'm already like, Jesus, it's so exciting that they just kill them all. It is <laughs> so satisfying that these bunch of people who you recognize in iconic roles show up, derail the movie into nostalgic fan service, and then brutally die one after another <laughs> so the movie can get back to being about what it was about. Now I'm like, that is kind of brilliant. And I kind of admire it. If Wolverine and Deadpool just did that, would I be content? Would I be happier? Yeah, but the point of that is it doesn't matter who those four characters yeah. that get killed in Multiverse of Madness is. It has no bearing on the plot. Does it need to be Black Bolt? No, it doesn't. Does it need to be Captain Carter? No, it doesn't. Does it need to be Xavier? But we talked about this. It doesn't need to be Elektra. It doesn't need to be Gambit. It just needs to be an archetype or an idea that fits that particular role. You said it could be Emma Frost. I think it's a bit more egregious with Xavier because of the fact that we did have that emotional farewell. And funnily enough, we haven't had that goodbye to Magneto, to the Ian McKellen one. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm astonished that they couldn't, whether McKellen didn't want to or whether they couldn't convince him to come back. This isn't the story that McKellen was jokingly, admittedly joking. I don't think he was seriously, but he was a little offended that was it Jackman asked Stuart and didn't ask him because obviously him and Stuart are the best buds. Did he, Stuart perform his wedding or did he perform Stuart's wedding? I think he performed Stuart's wedding. But there is this relationship between the two and this joking rivalry of, well, they keep bringing Patrick back, but they never bring me back. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably a bit of jest, isn't it? Because yeah. Because Ian McKellen is happy enough doing Hamlet again. And he's, to be fair, quite old as well. The thing with Stuart is the role of Xavier is not excessively physically demanding. You can put him in a wheelchair and have him hold his temple. And that's all you need him to do. <laughs> Whereas I know, theoretically, all you need to do is have McKellen do some hand acting. <laughs> it's a Fassbender and Elizabeth Olsen, I think, share similar hand acting. They've talked about how important hand acting is to their performance as superhero <laughs> villains. But there is a bit more physical strain involved. You will have to lift him up on wires and stuff. And he's 80 odd years old. It's interesting when you look at Days of Future Past, the way they distinguish, other than them being played by different actors of different ages, but the way they distinguish between Magneto and the two eras is that McKellen's hand gestures are far less theatrical. Yeah. He just casually lifts his hands and stuff happens, whereas... You feel the strain of Fassbender, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting distinction, but I don't know, maybe we will. Secret Wars, if Ian McKellen's still around, <laughs> <laughs> I reckon they'll do a scene. Maybe. Again, I'm kind of dreading. Secret Wars, I love the comic so much. The comic is so great. You can do so much interesting stuff with it. I actually prefer the original Secret War. Oh, interest. Ah, there's a separate conversation we don't have two hours to spend on, Greg. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, but just the idea of current version of heroes, current version of villains, smashed together, let make them fight. It was designed to sell toys, right? It was designed to sell a range of toys, and that's exactly what Battle World is. You give a bunch of kids a bunch of toys and watch what happens happens. Or the 90s Spider-Man take on Secret <laughs> Wars was good as well. Take that, Jonathan Hickman. More like Jonathan Hackman. <laughs> the problem I had with the Hickman version of Secret Wars is I guess I'd been checked out of a lot of comics continuity for such okay. a long time. So I didn't really know who most of the variants were. And I didn't know who I was following at any given time. Have you read the Hickman Avengers one that leads into it? Sorry, this is a tangent, but a tangent. This is pure comic nerdery. I don't know if I have or not. Okay, well then that might be the problem because it's very much a closing arc of his Avengers epic is the thing. Right, okay. But anyway, I found out about Messy and Disjointed in the way that all Marvel events and comics these okay. days are just messy and disjointed because that's all they do now isn't it it's i'm not disagreeing i don't think marvel's event comics are brilliant or anything like that i found secret wars to be the exception rather than the rule that's interesting i need to think about it more but i prefer the original secret war okay right. the 12 issues it's neat the maxi series and we beat dc to the punch <laughs> just about in under the line but it had a lot of consequences you got the venom symbiote black suit yeah you got colossus and kitty pride's problematic relationship ending all that stuff oh yeah <laughs> so that's something that's what makes she hulk be in the fantastic four for a bit isn't it because the thing stays behind it's been ages since i've read it anyway besides the point so yes logan worked for me in this and just love seeing hugh jackman in that role it's just something i'm always going to enjoy well don't worry craig until you're 90 until you're 90 yeah which is a great joke because he's already said i'm 200 something years yeah. old so he will be in secret wars he he's already said he wants to do an avengers movie so yeah 
Yeah, let Hugh Jackman do it. Why not? He's earned it. He has. Let him beat Robert Downey Jr. in terms of appearances as a single character. (laughs) I like some very clever weasel wording there as a single (laughs) character. And then they keep getting into the weeds of, well, in this film, you're not the same Wolverine as this film, are you? Yeah, that's exactly it. This is the thing, Craig. We would absolutely be counting Logan and Deadpool and Wolverine as part of that run. This is the thing. It's not as simple as the comic book continuity Earth 1 triple zero five. Well, there's X-Men 1 through 3, and then <laughs> X-Men Origins Wolverine's a different guy. Presumably he's a first-class Wolverine, then logically has to be a different guy as well, because that's a different continuity, right? And then is the Apocalypse Wolverine the same as the first-class Wolverine? I think so. He would have to be, because you see him getting into custody at the end of Days of Future Past, even though he's had the personality of future Wolverine put into him by mystique for some reason (laughs) that would have worked so much better if you didn't have the glowing eyes in that scene with the worst actor to play striker look the other one's brian cox and then oh obviously danny houston fair play to mister he's the guy who's scrotus in the new mad max which i love i love that it's just like make me ugly george because he was also one of the war boys in mad max fury road and now furiosa he's scrotus he is a very handsome man let's be clear a very handsome man he's like make me dirty george and george (laughs) is like yeah well yeah so we have some villains in this movie uh, Cassandra indeed. Nova is probably our main one. Yeah. And this was a character that I was very perplexed about appearing in a film like this because of the complicated backstory. And I explained that backstory to someone that didn't know it on a different podcast. And they were like, what? What on earth is Grant this? Grant Morrison. <laughs> yeah. So it's Xavier's twin sister, which is something that you do in comics when you have no other ideas, isn't it? There's a secret twin yeah. sister. But she was killed in the womb for trying to kill him. Yeah. And then she existed as a smear or something on a sewer wall for decades until getting a body. And then there she is. And madness ensues. She's his mamandra, I think, is how Morrison classifies it, which is basically the personification of all his worst impulses. As opposed to... Onslaught. Xavier just not being a great dude by yeah. himself. Yeah, the idea is that he just represses all that stuff and it occasionally bubbles out. <laughs> Wasn't well, Onslaught when he breaks Magneto's mind or something like that? Yeah. yeah Xavier's not a nice guy. No, Professor Xavier's a jerk, to quote the great Kitty Pride. Yeah, definitely. But Cassandra Nova, a weird villain for this, and I would think that she would maybe be someone that could have turned up in Legion quite happily. Yeah. With no changes. But I do like that they just give you that quick digest of her backstory and everyone's like, what the fuck? What's going on? That's twisted. What's going on here? And then I think the visualization of her power is really good. Lifted directly from Frank Quietly's artwork. Yeah. yeah. She has to literally touch people's mind. And you get that fingers through the face thing, which is just a great, yeah. Yeah, that was a nice little visual. And I think Emma Corrin was very good as well. Yes, I think they give the best performance in the movie. You can see it, even in wide shots, Corrin is having a ball. Not just when the close-up is on them, not just when the camera's on their face. There are several scenes of, again, Reynolds and Jackman playing off one another with Corrin's in the background. And you can see them just having a good campy time. Because this is not a particularly well-developed villain role. Her ultimate motivation is she wants to destroy everything, everywhere, all at once. (laughs) It's standard Marvel villain stuff which is i want to destroy as much as i can for um reasons that i'm angry about well her motivation was fine up until that point i'm the queen of my own little kingdom and i'm happy here i don't want to be anywhere else i love controlling everybody here and then it comes into yeah i want to destroy everything except from where i am it's time to get into the third act we need some gratuitous cgi i have a big boring crazy hot take on what this movie is and cassandra nova and this is probably nuts so let's just lay it all out here go for it craig Have you noticed that a lot of recent mainstream blockbusters express an anxiety about the absence of God in a grand philosophical sense? So off the top of my head, if I were to pick a couple, Fast X, for example, has a villain literally called Dante, who's introduced trying to blow up the Vatican and wants to turn Dom Toretto into a martyr. Last year in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, you had the High Evolutionary, who screams at the top of his lungs, there is no God. That's why I stepped in. You have the twin releases of Barbenheimer, where, according to Greta Gerwig, Barbie is a creation myth, a reverse genesis. It is a story of the exile from the garden, where the snake is literally patriarchy. But you have the idea of the ghost of Barbie's creator haunting that movie, but also being confined to a single space, and Barbie learning to exist without her creator being in the world. You have Oppenheimer, where you have this idea of literally 
essentially the postmodern Prometheus, the taking of fire from the gods. A revelation of divine power is what that atomic bomb is described as. You go later in the year, and even earlier this year, you have movies like, say, Twister, where you have this idea of it's half science, it's half religion, but it's also the moment of the climax of that movie where a character in the car takes their hands off the wheels and just puts their hands on their lap and accepts whatever the tornado, which is an act of God, a force of nature, is going to do to them. So you have this big recurring motif running through American pop cinema. And what's really interesting is if we accept that there is a crisis of faith rippling and working its way through American popular cinema, how do we solve that, Craig? And I think you and I have discussed half of that, which is you try to fill that gap with intellectual property. Because what is Madam Web, Craig, I ask you, but a Spider-Man nativity play? It is a story that tries to position Spider-Man in the role of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, who is born and will save us and has to be killed by some monster who has seen through prophecy that the creation or the events will lead to his downfall. A King Herod, if you will. Although obviously that gets mangled in post-production and we have to heavily <laughs> redub the entire performance. But you get my Here, you have this idea of the void. And you have this idea of the TVA. They're not really acting in any authority. Paradox is acting with no oversight whatsoever. They don't even really prune people anymore because that's not something they're cool with. And you have this idea of the void, which is this absence. It's purgatory. It's this space where characters go where they aren't dead, they aren't alive. And throughout the movie, you have this idea of the anchor being, who we haven't really talked about, but Wolverine, who dies and who through his resurrection and redemption. He saves this fallen world of ours. He becomes this anchor being. He heals the timeline. He allows the world to live on. He dies and he is born again. What is the X, Craig? But a cross turned 45 degrees. (laughs) You even have the absent father figure here. You pointed it out. Cassandra Nova. What's the point of doing a Cassandra Nova story without doing Charles Xavier. She's Charles's twin. Surely she's a character who is defined by her relationship to Charles. But as we point out, not a single Charles Xavier exists in this movie. McAvoy isn't here. Stewart isn't here. Not even Lloyd from Legion bothers to show up. And you have the moment where Cassandra talks about how, yep, we do get some Charles through here, but never mind. She's introduced riding Charles's wheelchair. Because if God's throne is absent, then so is Xavier's wheelchair. And you have this idea of Nova as this vaguely Miltonian figure, this character cast out, who's chosen to, rather than serve in heaven, she would rule in hell. I'm being a little bit facetious here. I may be putting a bit more stress on this movie than it can probably bear, but I do think there is something very interesting in the none-too-subtle religious coding of this movie as a redemption narrative in which you have Charles Xavier as an absent father figure, you have Cassandra Nova as this kind of exiled Middletonian kind of Luciferian figure, and you have Wolverine himself. Wade jokes, I'm the Messiah, I'm Marvel Jesus. He's not. Wolverine is Marvel Jesus. Dies resurrected, redeemed, saves the soul of the universe. That is my big, crazy, big swing take on Deadpool and Wolverine. I'm still reeling from the suggestion of depth you gave to Fast X. (laughs) That's a reach. (laughs) No, 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 no. Okay, I like that you're bringing it back to Fast X. Fast X is core, right? Do you remember what Dante's motivation in Fast X is? It's to avenge his dad, isn't it? No, no. Why is he like the way that he is? I honestly don't remember. Okay, he has this scene where he talks about it. They retroactively insert him into the climax of Fast Five, which is like evoking Logan for Deadpool and Wolverine. Evoking Fast Five is a bad choice because whenever I'm watching a movie that reminds me of Fast Five, I'm like, why isn't this movie as good as Fast Five? (laughs) But they reveal that he was in the chase sequence in Fast Five and he went over the edge and he went into the water and he died. He was clinically dead for like 90 seconds. And he has this big monologue where he talks about, you know what I saw when I was dead? Nothing. Darkness. The Void. That's because nobody dies in fast movies. (laughs) Nobody can. Yeah, there is no heaven because they've just shut it down. There's no business here. (laughs) His whole motivation, his character motivation is that he died and there was nothing. There was no afterlife. There was no heaven. There was no hell. There was no great beyond. And so he kind of rages against it. That movie is a mess. It makes no sense. It is bad. To be clear, I am not endorsing Fast X here. It is a bad movie, but there is a weird through line through it of a religious text. It is about a villain who died, didn't see the face of God, and so decides to blow up the Vatican, turn Dom Toretto into a martyr, and Dom's 
followers, his family, are treated as Christians during the Roman Empire, where they're making all these coded signals to each other, which include crucifixes. I don't know if it's a conscious thing. I don't know if it's something that's just a set of recognizable iconography thrown together, but it is there. This is weird. I'm trying to convince you I'm not crazy, but what is a greater way to convince somebody that you're crazy than saying, Craig, I'm not crazy? What's a greater way to convince people that you're not crazy than by saying, Fast X has depth? Well, I mean, what else is Jason Momoa drowning in, to be fair? <laughs> That's true. It's the only depth in the movie. Well, yeah, I mean, he's a big guy. You need a lot of water. Three inches ain't going to do it. I see your through line there, and I'm just thinking further back, even just with Marvel, you had Eternals, which is about seeking out God. And trying to kill God. Would you abort God is a question there. And then Love and Thunder is about what role do gods play in the universe anymore. Yeah, you have the God Butcher as the villain of that movie. And again, he's redeemed through IP. It makes a mess of that whole premise, doesn't <laughs> yeah. it? But it's kind of there. It's the idea of, do we need gods anymore? What is the ending of Love and Thunder, Craig? You don't need gods because you have IP. Faith is restored <laughs> by superheroes. What restores Gore the God Butcher's faith in the universe is <laughs> Thor the superhero. <laughs> Not Thor the Norse god, Thor the superhero. It's like the whole Klingon ethos in Star Trek, isn't it? We killed all our gods. There were more trouble than they were worth. <laughs> Love that. And even as far back as the Clash of the Titans remake, and then its sequel, Wrath of the Titans, that's about forsaking gods, isn't it? And the arrival of monotheism as well as part of it. I'm talking about Wrath of the Titans I haven't seen in years. If I remember correctly, the plot of that is that Hades wants there to only be one god. It's this weird metaphor, I don't know if it's intentional, but about this journey towards paganism and Greek religious belief systems towards monotheism. Again, it's very weird. It's very weird. But yeah, this is what I was thinking while watching the movie, which gives you a sense of where my brain was at. <laughs> so Cassandra Nova, yeah, ruling in hell. <laughs> yeah, it's a common thing, isn't it? And it folds into the overarching theme with Deadpool, with the idea of finding your place or being happy in your place. I don't know that that's an aspirational thing. Cassandra Nova was happy in her place. Everybody in the wasteland lived in constant fear of being turned inside out, but Cassandra Nova found her place. She self-actualized. To be fair, if they left her alone, <laughs> then she wouldn't have tried to destroy everything. It's that, what evil are we content with keeping around? It's almost another tangent, but in the Angel finale, where it seemed like Angel was going to let Lindsay be in charge of Wolfram and Hart, because you're the devil I know, and I'd rather you be in that chair than anyone else. And it turns out he was just Barring them up so you could have them killed. Spoilers for the angel finale. But it's <laughs> that idea of what level of evil are we comfortable enough with accepting in order to keep society running. As part of the system, yeah. Yeah, it's the, again, Star Trek section 31 issue. We're just going to pretend we don't know they exist and let them sneak about in the background and keep us safe. That's what section 31 are all about. So you could have done something with that. The idea of paradox keeps Cassandra Nova in her place, lets her do whatever she wants, all these variants that he doesn't care about that get sent to the void because otherwise she would be exercising the capability she has to do further damage or major damage to the multiverse, which you see happen. And to be fair, he gives her the tools to do that because he's an idiot. But yeah, that's her place. And Deadpool wants to find his place. And Logan, does he want to find his place? He eventually does, I suppose. <laughs> Or he wants his place to be more hospitable for him, I guess. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting take, the idea of Xavier's your absent god and, and she's resentful of him. And I liked Wolverine's speech about... He never taught me temperance. Yeah. He is her brother, but he's also treated as her father. He never taught me temperance. There was no Charles to teach me. Yeah, and then if you think about Xavier's relationship with Mystique in the reboot slash prequel slash whatever the hell they are, series of X-Men movies. He's a brother, but he's also very paternalistic. Yeah. And you have other examples of that in media where brothers have effectively acted as father figures. You get that in Buffy with Dawn and Onward is a film I'm thinking of. Yeah, which is literally about that. That's exactly what the premise of the film is, yeah. The reveal is he doesn't need to speak to his dad because his dad was there all along. It's a weird tangent of sentiment there, but I do think that works with Cassandra Nova and I do think she's an interesting character that maybe should have been in a different film. I do wonder <laughs> if you could have accomplished functionally the same thing with some other less complicated character, maybe? Well, with anybody. Again, this is an MCU movie, so the villains are purely there to be functional. The movie hands off villains. It introduces Paradox as a villain, then it hands off to Cassandra Nova, then it seems like Paradox is back, but oh no, it turns out it was really Cassandra Nova. And that kind of serves to distract from the fact that there's no real strong villain. I think Corrin is very good here, but they're very much doing campy British villain. I love the moment where they put the 
juggernaut helmet on her and Deadpool's like, why are you like this? And she's laughing going, I have no idea! And it, it really does feel like that's the script acknowledging maybe the character doesn't have the strongest central core of their being. I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. Yeah. At least I'll remember Cassandra Nova after this film rather than whoever the hell it was in the Marvels. There. There's a strange disparity in the marriage of Tom Hiddleston and his wife. Yeah. I get to play a character people will remember, you don't. But we're both in the same franchise. Yeah. Well, the Marvels is its own unfortunate bag of issues. Oh, yeah. But will we ever see Cassandra Nova again? Probably not. I think this is it. We'll never get to that stage. I think that's the problem with a lot of X-Men lore is just so much of it and we're not ever really going to scratch the surface. This is the question, what is the MCU going to do with the X-Men? Because there's so much stuff to do. There's so much new stuff. There's stuff that hasn't been on screen before. I mean, obviously you have Dark Phoenix, but you have things like, say, The Shire and you have things like, say, the Outback era. You've got the Ravager. Okay, the Ravagers are kind of in Logan as well. Shadow King, who was in Legion. You have so much that you can do that you can bring in into the films that would be interesting and novel and exciting to try and do. Yeah, let's not do Dark Phoenix for a third time, thanks. You look at the MCU and you look at the way that they're treating the property that they have now, and they're going to take another stab at Apocalypse probably, aren't they? I think Sinister should be their first go for X-Men. <laughs> but we're going to spunk Doctor Doom and Galactus in the space of a couple of years, so yeah, I'm not optimistic about any level of restraint. <laughs> We need to hit a billion dollars, Greg. We need to prove that this isn't just a flash in the pan. Because 10 years isn't enough of a success story. An incredible run. That's the subtext of people talking about Marvel fatigue. Fans get very upset whenever you mention it. But this lasted 10 years. For 10 years, it was the biggest thing in pop culture. Now it is maybe the third biggest thing. It's not a huge step down. It's not like it's fallen on its face or it's disappeared. It's producing three movies a year and one of those is a hit. That was what happened last year. I suspect it's probably what's going to happen next year. And that's not a judgment on those movies. Brave New World might be wonderful. Thunderbolts might be wonderful. Are people going to turn out for Fantastic Four? Third time round? Do we think that audiences are going to get excited about Fantastic Four? The film that isn't even set in the MCU. Yeah. I think the MCU will continue on just fine. I think that trying to recapture the glory of the 2019 era is a fool's errand that is going to diminish the company, but also diminish the larger culture. I think they just need to stop micromanaging the shit out of it, to be fair. I think they just need to get back to the fundamentals of, let's make movies and they might be good. Make good movies, yeah. And if they're good, then build on them. Build on the good ones. And the people who make good movies, let them make more good movies. I like Shang-Chi, but we haven't even heard of him since. I'm less fond of Shang-Chi than most. That's the thing. We know who the villain of the multiverse saga is. I mean, we always knew who it was. It was Kang. And then it wasn't Kang for very obvious reasons. But I love that they're immediately like, okay, hard pivot, Kang to Doom. But who is the protagonist of Doomsday and Secret Wars? And I know the cheat answer is, oh, well, Thanos was the protagonist of Infinity War. But no, I know going into Infinity War, I am following Cap, I'm following Iron Man, and uh, I guess Thor's going to be there too. Going into Doomsday, uh, uh, Peter's probably going to be there? Deadpool now, I get. Who is going to be the functional heroic lead of Doomsday and Secret Wars? I can't tell you. I have no idea. And I would have known from the outset that it was going to be Iron Man, Cap, and Thor were going to be the big three in Infinity War and Endgame. And I think the unfortunate passing of Chadwick Boseman has knackered a lot of those plans because they were clearly planning to hang a lot on him. Well, I think it was Chadwick Boseman, it was Brie Larson, and then I guess Tom Holland, Spider-Man, maybe. Those are probably the three they were going for. Yeah, but then Chadwick Boseman dies, everyone hates Brie Larson, so yeah. you still have Tom Holland, Spider-Man. But even Tom Holland feels pretty tired by the end of it. Maybe Strange, it was clear that they were positioning Strange as this stand-in for Stark, the goateed, wise-cracking, rich guy. And that's very much something that's like, okay, well, we may be burnt out Cumberbatch. Maybe Maybe Cumberbatch needs to go away and relax for a little while <laughs> after making two multiversal movies in the space of six months. <laughs> Maybe. It's a confusing one, but I don't know there's a lot to say about Cassandra Nova other than she's very entertaining yeah. and her power is sufficiently creepy. I like the way they used Pyro as well. You get the shades of, there's people that are just want to overthrow her, but they can't because they know what she'll do to them. And then he's about to give that speech and he gets knocked out. Not everybody gets a speech. Not everybody gets a speech, yeah. And it's Logan kind of breaking the fourth wall in that moment as well. And that's what I love about the fourth wall breaks in the Deadpool movies is they happen in real time. So people notice he's doing it, but anybody that doesn't know what he's doing thinks he's just nuts. So he turns and talks to the audience and you'll see a reaction from other characters. There's that moment in the TVA where he just wanders away to talk to the camera and you can see it from another angle and there's no camera. That was funny, yeah. And it's when 
nice pool breaks the fourth wall and Logan's like, what the fuck? What was that? What are you doing? Yeah. You get that in the other films as well, where he's like, McAvoy or Stuart, which Xavier we're going to see, and Colossus just ignores him and drags him along. But in the She-Hulk TV show, when she broke the fourth wall, the scene was playing out as if she was still a part of it, but she wasn't interacting with it. So I find that a bit of a strange approach. So I think it works in Deadpool for that reason, because it could just be that he's nuts and he's not actually breaking the fourth wall. He's just saying stuff that makes sense to him, but don't make sense to anybody else. And I think you have to be careful with the layers of reality, especially in a mega franchise like this, the idea of what's to stop She-Hulk just leaving Secret Wars and asking Kev I end it, make a new ending. That's the thing. And that's always been the way with Deadpool in comics. Well, yeah, he's done the kills the Marvel Universe thing and then he leaves the comics and kills all the artists and stuff at the end of it. He can do that, but he can also just be a straight up superhero lead like in, say, Rick Remender's own Canny X-Force. That is a, a series that takes Deadpool seriously as a character treats him as a source of drama with actual integrity and motivation and a grounded sense of being a larger part of an ensemble i do think that it is possible to do that with deadpool it just requires a great deal of skill she hulk as well where she hulk in the comics also breaks the fourth wall but she can also be a member of the fantastic four from time to time or a member of the avengers i don't think they'll do that with movie deadpool though i don't think they'll ever have him climb out of a film and ask for a better one like proper gremlins 2 that feels like a missed opportunity i kind of want the gremlins 2 of superhero movies I kind of want the anarchic kind of Looney Tunes vibe. And it does feel like it's too tight and it's too controlled, particularly now. Whatever about Under Fox, where he seemed to be able to get away with whatever he wanted to do. Here, it does seem like there are things you can't do. And we'll joke about cocaine being one of them to distract from the fact that it's really we can't make fun of Cap and Iron Man and Thor because those are the characters that are important to the brand. Although he did say you're joining the MCU a bit of a low point. He did and there is another line as well that makes it kind of a similar thing. The multiverse it hasn't worked has it? The multiverse it hasn't worked that's the other one. I think it's been consistently great since Endgame says nice pool. But again those are very much accepted on brand. It's like the moment where Wesley Snipes does the there's only ever going to be one blade. That stays in the movie because we know from behind the scenes reporting that it's not Mahersha Ali who is dragging his feet on the movie. We know that Mahersha Ali's lawyer, not his agent, not his manager, his lawyer has said that she has never experienced anything like this before dealing with a studio trying to get the movie made. The deal was made in 2019 it was announced at the same time as WandaVision wasn't it? Yeah, and he's a two time Oscar winner (laughs) and it's a property that everybody gets it's not hard to crack, it's not like we're trying to adapt Gravity's Rainbow or anything like that, but the fact that 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 joke stays in the movie as irreverent as it seems i'm watching it and i'm going no that stayed in the movie because there were like five management calls about it and the idea that maybe if mahershali sees it throws down his popcorn and says fuck this and walks away maybe marvel can just clean their hands and be like well that's a one problem all of our slate <laughs> there is a certain sense of it doesn't feel as anarchic as what would happen when you would let somebody like zemeckis loose in a movie like who framed roger rabbit or when you would let dante loose with obviously mentioned gremlins too It feels like there's a window for that. There's an opportunity for that. And I wish it were that. I think I'm okay with them, as I say, gently tapping the fourth wall (laughs) rather than fully breaking it. Because I do think it's somewhat limited in terms of storytelling in a lot of ways. As in, like I say, if if a character's aware they're in a fictional world, then you almost have this two tiers of reality within the MCU, which She-Hulk created. So the idea of we're watching a TV show through another layer, there's a layer within that well, TV shows and movies, but there's a layer where there's a creative team that the characters in theory have access to. I will say, one thing I was really aggravated about by She-Hulk was that they have the writer's room, but they don't let the writers play themselves. They cast actors as the writers, and they are playing Zeb Wells, who is a writer on this movie as well. Just let Zeb Wells play Zeb Wells. (laughs) It's a weird thing to get hung up on in terms of layers of reality, where it's, no, 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 there is a Zeb Wells in the MCU, but he's not played by Zeb Wells. What's the point in having a Zeb Wells? (laughs) Why can't he just be writer number two? And why does he need to be a writer at all? It's weird that you and I basically seem to have the opposite philosophical approach to it, but neither of us is satisfied by what she hooked did. <laughs> it's almost like if the last episode of Star Trek was just far beyond the stars was actually real. There was the joke about apparently Bear did consider it, having Benny Russell finish the script for Star Trek on the Paramount Studio backlot. I'm going to be honest, I wouldn't have minded that. It wouldn't have made me feel like Voyager didn't matter or quote unquote wasn't real. It wouldn't have prevented me from enjoying half of Enterprise 
Enterprise or whatever much of Enterprise I enjoyed. But it would have been a nice little ending for Deep Space Nine. And it would have been just a perfect place to leave it. It's like the Tommy Westfall thing, where it's fun to think about, but I don't need to rationally work out how that relates to Mulder and Scully on the X-Files when they're solving Fluke Man. I don't need to be going in my brain, but wait, isn't this all inside the snow globe in Tommy Westfall's head at the end of St. Elsewhere? (laughs) I can just accept that on its own terms. And I think I can accept the fourth wall breaks on their own terms. I don't need to understand why She-Hulk doesn't stop the climax of Secret Wars to go talk to K-E-V-I-N. I can just follow that and understand that. Maybe you could do a She-Hulk episode where she does that, but I don't need you to stop the movie because she's a supporting character. This isn't a She-Hulk story. If she's there at all. Yeah, if she's there, which she probably won't be, Teddy Adam Aslani. We respect people who talk openly about their opinions and should celebrate that. We just don't cast them again. Yeah. It would be great if they just kept recasting the banners. (laughs) It could happen. She'll show up in the void in a future thing where one company swallows another company and then (laughs) they make another one of these. But I think all sci-fi slash fantasy properties have the episode where, is the main character actually mad? Buffy did it. Fair mind in Star Trek The Next Generation, yeah. Yeah. Moon Knight. There's an episode of Smallville that suggests that he's just in an insane asylum the whole time. and So you get that eventually and it usually ends up being a, a ruse of some sort. But then there's also the, well, what if? The Buffy one plays with that, with the idea of she just retreats back into herself and it's, are we just seeing the fantasy from here on out? Or, I mean, obviously you're not because there's a spin-off. Yeah, like maybe it's a very involved fantasy, Craig. Maybe she, this person has a very rich inner life. <laughs> that's the thing because that take is so familiar and because i'm so used to the oh no it's never meant to be taken real i do admire the idea of bear being like and by the way just so you're clear the final shot of the show is going to be benny russell really exists <laughs> and that's a very esoteric reference to a lot of listeners yeah sorry basically there was an episode of star trek deep space nine that suggested that captain cisco was the invention of a 1950s writer who came up with the deep space nine concept And possibly all of Star Trek, it's not quite clear. (laughs) I guess by association. (laughs) Did a lot of spitballing. Because Picard exists in his little fantasy, doesn't he? And so uh, (laughs) Did Benny Russell come up with Picard season one and two and three? Ugh. Again, this is the thing, not to turn this into a Deep Space Nine podcast, I love Iris Stephen Bear so much. Isn't the story that they tell where they were making First Contact and First Contact was going to have the Defiant in it, which is the ship from Deep Space Nine, because Worf was on Deep Space Nine at the time, they need to get Worf onto the Enterprise so Worf could be with the cast of the next generation. So they bring the Defiant and it's going to be at a battle scene with the Borg and the Borg are meant to be scary, so I believe it's Rick Berman comes up with the idea of what if the Borg destroy the Defiant in order to escalate the stakes. And apparently Bear says, yeah, sure, you can do that, but we're going to have the Defiant back on Deep Space Nine next week. (laughs) <laughs> we're just not going to acknowledge that you blew it up. You can blow it up in the movie if you want, but we're just going to keep having the Defiant on the show. Which gives birth to the line, adrift but salvageable. Yeah, I kind of love that ability to manage your own little pool of a pocket universe by just saying, well, I'm going to take my fucking ball and go home. Just so we're clear, you're playing with my toys. You're going to give it back to me in the condition that I gave it to you. You signed off on us building the set and the model. And we're going to keep using the sets of the model. We'll get our money's worth out of these. Don't you worry about that. Yeah, so that's the kind of attitude I would have liked a bit more from Deadpool and Wolverine. Hey, Disney, we're going to make you a billion dollars, but we get to say whatever the fuck we want about your properties. (laughs) That I would have respected a bit more. That's kind of where I think the gap is for me. I liked that all the referencing was related to the Fox slash New Line, I guess, era because of Blade. And Blade doesn't have a signature Blade, which annoyed me. It's sword with the spiky handle and he repeats the line some motherfuckers always trying to ice skate uphill and i'm like just come up with a new wesley snipes line he does it on twitter all the time do what david s goyer did which is listen to wesley snipes and go that is a cool line it's in the movie don't have him say the exact same thing again does blade know that's a catchphrase that thing he said (laughs) one time it's like that bit from spider-man no way home with willem dafoe some scientist myself and you can tell that willem dafoe has never in the 20 plus years since he played that role thought about the words i'm some Something of a scientist myself but he was told by the director it's something they say on the internet it's like oh okay i guess i'll do that then it was in the trailer for the first spider-man movie which probably didn't help yeah it's weird anyway that's the stuff where it's like if you're bringing wesley snipes back you have an opportunity to do some cool new stuff whatever about him as a human being whatever about him as a person who pays taxes whatever about him as a co-star collaborator and co-worker he is a screen presence and he is an icon and he is a large part of what makes blade special so if you're gonna bring him back let him do wesley snipes stuff don't just trap him in the box of doing stuff that blade did all those years ago he fires a rocket launcher which blade never did fair 
At least not that I remember. <laughs> and there's references to The Punisher. I was kind of hoping for a Tom Jane cameo or a Dolph Lundgren. That might have been fun. They should have canonized Laundry Day. <laughs> the best Punisher movie. Oh, yeah. Again, it's one of those situations where I kind of want to see these things, but also I don't want it to be buried under it, yeah. its own reference points. I feel like I got enough for the most part. Yeah, I felt like I got too much. Please, sir, no more. <laughs> And I think they used X-23 fairly well for what they did. I like the little touch where she puts on her cheap sunglasses, you know, the flowery sunglasses. I think she might be well-placed to pick that character up again, to be honest. In terms of age. The thing with X-23 is, this is the thing, with Logan, the idea is Logan sacrifices himself so the kids have a fighting chance. As his idea of what it is to be a parent, it means to sacrifice for your kids in the big abstract way. And... Deadpool and Wolverine is like, no, 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 no. Great thing about being a parent is that sometimes a kid will sacrifice themselves and condemn themselves (laughs) to an eternity of non-existence in order to get you back into the main movie franchise. (laughs) There's something weird about that where Logan's whole arc is... And clearly she is meant to be the X-23 from Logan. Whatever about him not being the Logan from Logan, she's the X-23 from Logan. Or a variation thereof. Or a variation thereof. And the idea is in Logan, Wolverine gave his life so that she could be free. And so she didn't have to kill again and there would be no more guns in the valley. And the kids could wander off and be free and be safe and have their own future. And here she's brought back and she's like, no, I'm going to sacrifice myself so Hugh Jackman can wear the yellow costume (laughs) from the X-Men the animated series. Again, I'm sorry to keep hitting the word, but it does feel a little jaded to me. But she does live and she gets brought into a new home. And it's funny how Deadpool says, you think you could maybe rescue some friends? And all they bring is X-23. <laughs> no Gambit, no Electra, no Blade. None of those guys are there. The budget wouldn't stretch to it. Yeah, to put them in that scene at the end. I know some people have said, why don't Marvel just make Daphne Keen their Wolverine? And I wouldn't be against that prospect actually i think she still plays the role fairly well like she did before when she was how old was she when she made she was very young honestly part of me is like i don't want a situation like this where obviously it doesn't affect logan but i'm watching this and i'm thinking man logan was pretty good and instead of thinking man this movie's pretty good and that's the risk when you do that with laura is you bring her back and she's in the marvel x-men movies and i'm sitting there and i'm not going man this x-men movie's pretty good i'm like man remember when she was in logan Logan was pretty good. (laughs) That's the thing about us. And it doesn't seem to work this way for other people. But for me, that's the big thing with nostalgia. Because I'm watching it and I'm going, Michael Keaton's Batman. Michael Keaton was Batman in two other movies. Those other two movies are pretty good. This Flash movie, not very good. I should be watching those other two Michael Keaton Batman movies. I could be watching them both right now. Why am I watching this? Why is there two hours of this? (laughs) Why isn't it over yet? You're describing the feeling I had when watching... Jurassic World. All I wanted to do when watching Jurassic World was watch Jurassic Park. Watch Jurassic Park. Hey, I, I have another great movie with dinosaurs and Sam Neill and Jeff Goldblum and Laura Dern in it. Well, no, no, I'm talking about the first Jurassic World. Oh, okay. I think by Dominion I was cold to the whole notion <laughs> of it by then. Even though I quite liked Fallen Kingdom, actually. Yes, this is a separate podcast, but Fallen Kingdom is maybe the third best Jurassic Park movie, which is the lowest of bars. <laughs> it doesn't even clear it. It kind of tips it as it goes over. The bar kind of wobbles. We have to call the adjudicators and they're like, well, we'll allow it, but don't let it happen again. <laughs> the first Jurassic World, I was like, oh, yeah, there's the big door. I remember when another <laughs> film did that. There's the John Williams music. I really like the John Williams music. There's a herd of Gallimimus. I remember that from something else. It was one of the first things I did, actually, after I got home from Jurassic World, was I just watched Jurassic Park. Hey, look, it's the same T-Rex from Jurassic Park. (laughs) Or Star Trek Into Darkness. God, I wish I was watching Wrath of Khan instead of this. (laughs) I think there's a lot of versions of this, but I never felt like that during this. Okay. And I thought that Daphne Keene aging into an older X-23, I can forget the character's actual name. Laura Kinney. That's it. I think she aged into it quite well. She didn't have an awful lot to do, but she had that specifically one meaningful scene. So yeah, I think she could pick that up and run with it. She has become Wolverine in the comics, hasn't she? Yeah. Tom Taylor's run, which is very good, actually. quite enjoy it. Again, it's very light comics, very accessible. During the time that Wolverine was dead at one point. She is still Wolverine, or at least she was during the Hickman era. They're both Wolverine. Is it like Hawkeye? There's just two of them. There's just two of them. Same thing with Spider-Man. There's just two of them. That's fair enough. You could have two Wolverines in the MCU. The problem is, if you're going to have Laura Kinney appear as Wolverine, you kind of have this backstory that you need to explain, don't you? Yeah, that she's a clone of, yeah. Yeah, and where's the original Wolverine? Is he dead? Is he around? I don't know. He's unaffordable. 
But for me, I would like the Marvel X-Men to lean on the whole school aspect of it. So I would like to see the younger characters. Basically those five minutes of apocalypse that I liked. Scott's first day at the school, he's meeting everybody. Those deleted scenes where they're at the mall mucking about. Honestly, I just want it to be good. I, I don't care if it's Krakoa. I don't care if it's the Outback. I don't care if it's the school. I don't care if it's wherever else have they been over the years. I just want it to be good and I want it to be interesting. And I want it to not remind me of how much I enjoyed previous X-Men movies. <laughs> That's all I ask. Fair enough. Guess that takes care of Cassandra Nova, kind of. Yeah, eventually. Mr. Paradox, I think he suffers from the fact that he just disappears for so much of the film. But I think Matthew McFadden is actually very good. Well, he's doing a bit of a Richard E. Grant, weirdly. He's doing Tom Wombs again. This is a separate conversation, but obviously there's typecasting and there are iconic characters and there are characters who are beloved and recognized and actors who only play particular kind of roles, like Clint Eastwood playing cowboys, that sort of thing, and kind of outlaws and rugged individualists. And what's interesting about McFadden, he's the rare example of an actor who I can think of as having two very clear typecasts that are very clearly delineated, where he starts out and he does spooks or MI5s as it is in the States for American listeners, and then he does Pride and Prejudice, and he's this smouldering British sexy gentleman kind of character. And then he does Succession, and he's this clumsy corporate oaf. And it's very clear watching McFadden in movies that he has these two registers, and he is going to be cast in those registers. And if there's a flick that switches in Hollywood, where it's like, you can only ever be one thing, and the, the switch is now stuck on Tom Wamsagam, where Paradox is basically just a slightly campier version of Tom from Succession. Whereas Corin is showing me stuff that they hadn't done on, say, The Crown or A Murder at the End of the World. McFadden's showing me stuff that he can do in his sleep. And he's he's very good at it. I like the, you were so abusive. Ah. <laughs> or the, I eat my feelings as destroying my thing, making you hungry. Or the fact that he's a middle manager who just takes such joy in middle managing. <laughs> All that stuff is solid, but it's not exceptional. It's not particularly notable. I don't feel like there's an angle on who this character is. I kind of feel like the thing to do with him, which you never would have gotten away with, is to put him in a baseball cap and have him be cool. Have him be more recognizably Feige, because that's what this character kind of functionally is. He's the guy who's erasing timelines and shredding timelines and destroying continuity. So if you lean into it and you make him basically Feige, it would maybe work a bit more than, well, he's just... Tom Wamsagam from Succession. He's just a faceless suit. He's not a particular individual. And therefore, we don't have to deal with the fact that the reason that this is happening is because the company that's making this movie is the company that bought the studio that made these other movies that we're now referencing. Paradox does feel like he's a store-bought variant or model of an archetype that should be more central to this story than he actually is and who the movie is kind of afraid of doing anything interesting with because it might draw attention to what the movie actually functionally is for lack of a better word it sort of divorces him from the tva as well yes they have the iconography of it but it's, we're a splinter operation we're not part of it so don't worry about watching loki it's not important and then you have b15 turn up just for a scene or a scene or two just to kind of give you that continuity buff but again if you don't know who she is it's not important yeah. It does feel like this movie was written before the second season of Loki. They had no idea where Loki was ending and had to very quickly add that fix where it's like, oh yeah, the TVA doesn't do that anymore. Well, one of the rumours was that Owen Wilson was going to play a significant part in the film. Ooh, okay. Maybe he would have been the paradox equivalent at some point, but then it wouldn't make sense for his character as he develops in Loki. Because he seems like a nice guy. Yeah. I don't understand why they have outposts and subway stations. That's not something they do in Loki, but whatever. Well, that's necessary for the plot to move. And again, lots and lots of heavy, heavy info dumps. And again, McFadden, God bless him, a champ, talking with his mouth full with more than just cucumber sandwiches. <laughs> he eats through those exposition dumps as best he can and the movie does that's a lot of info for a threequel it's a thankless role and he does it as well as he can which is still not even as much fun as Corin is having yeah and he's the one that brings up the concept of the anchor beings which yes we alluded to i like that idea actually although i found myself thinking about the minutia of an anchor being and it was down to the fact that someone said in an interview that the mcu anchor being is still alive and I'm thinking, your anchor being has to live as long as the universe, because otherwise, as soon as they die, you only have a couple of thousand years left before the universe unravels. But what happens before they were born? That's one question, yeah. So is, is the anchor being concept transferable? I guess it is. Well, based on this movie, yes. Yeah, but then is 
a given universe any older than the point it was created as well. So The Amazing Spider-Man, for example, that universe started when that movie started. Yeah, but then you get into questions of who created it. But to get back to the initial point about there is no God, only IP. The thing about the anchor beings is that it's the chosen one at the most extreme level. It's not just that the chosen one saves the universe. It's that the chosen one's mere existence allows the universe to continue to exist. (laughs) Which is such insane superhero power fantasy nonsense taken to its most extreme. Turning the quiet part of the superhero fantasy up to its maximum volume, (laughs) which is the idea that there is nobody more important than Wolverine in the entire universe. I get that it's kind of a joke, but it's also played kind of straight. And yeah, I think that is tied to that there is no God, only IP. To be clear, I am agnostic. I'm not religious. I'm not going to these movies bringing this stuff with me. I'm going to these movies and they're throwing this stuff at me. But it is weird that it's like, yeah, no, to be clear, there is a God and he is Wolverine. The entire fate of the universe depends on Wolverine. I'm thinking Thinking about how hilarious it would be if the Marvel Cinematic Universe anchor being was Tom Holland's Spider-Man, (laughs) who belonged to Sony. Doesn't even belong there, yeah. Which, to be honest, would retrospectively make a great deal of sense about this Spamunk, the Sony Pictures Universe of Marvel characters, because they don't have their anchor being, so of course they're unraveling. It's just unraveling, yeah. Someone stole them at some point and then that was it. But also it's the meta-narrative of we can't make this universe work without Hugh Jackman. It's not profitable without him. So if he's not going to do it, we're just going to unravel it and and start again. That's just the way it is. So it feeds into that meta-narrative of what do you do about Deadpool in a collapsing universe? Which would be funny if it wasn't the same weekend that they announced they're bringing back Robert Downey Jr. (laughs) Now, maybe to some people that makes it more funny, but to me that just makes it incredibly cynical and depressing because you know that they're looking at this and seeing it entirely seriously. Well, apparently the first draft for Kang Dynasty was the TVA are scooping up anchor beings because they can fight Kang for some reason. And the film was going to be mostly centred on, say, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man and Hugh Jackman's Wolverine and some others. I am very tired, Craig. But it's weird that that rumour only came out now. Until two weeks ago, we never mentioned an anchor being, and now that's all they can talk about. So I'm pretty sure that it's going to feed into the plot of Doomsday at some point. Absolutely. Of course, we're going to see Deadpool and Wolverine. The fact that the movie made a billion dollars. The fact that it's the only or the only Marvel Studios production so far. Who knows how Fantastic Four will do? Who knows how Blade will do when it inevitably releases? Which it definitely will. (laughs) <laughs> but it's the only Marvel movie since Endgame, between Endgame and Doomsday, the only Marvel Studios movie to make a billion dollars. So, of course, they're going to be back. Yeah, for sure. And I think the anchor being concept interesting and getting bogged down the minutiae of it isn't really that important. It's not something that ruins my fun. I just like to think about these things. And it is almost something that you could have Deadpool question it. But hang on, Wolverine was born in 18 whatever. What about before then? Who was your anchor being then? Again, I would give props if props were due if they cut to some universe where Jesus was the anchor being <laughs> and just made the subtext of it explicit. There is an element there where if you're taking the continuity minutia of it, that does prevent you from ever doing things like stories set in the far, far future, which I quite like. You can't really jump that far ahead. In Loki, they do jump backwards and forwards through time. So presumably the anchor being has to have been alive at Pompeii, right? You'd think so. It's almost like it's a concept they just came up with and haven't really thought about. (laughs) This is very much like the Happy Hogan interview scene. You don't need to think about this. And if you're thinking about this, something's gone wrong. But I am with my little whiteboard going, wait a minute. So Pompeii does exist. And obviously Loki and Thor, although... Again, if an anchor being exists, if the universe comes into being, presumably everybody imagines that they have a past, even if they didn't. So obviously Thor and Loki and other immortal characters would remember a past, even if they didn't physically experience it. Anyway, this raises all sorts of interesting metaphysical questions. Plato's allegory of the cave. (laughs) Yeah. And again, it's a concept they came up with just to make a joke about this universe can't be profitable without Hugh Jackman in it. And once we're rid of him, there's no point in continuing. We tried it, didn't work. You say that they didn't really try it. No, they didn't. It came out before Deadpool 2, and Deadpool 2 was massively profitable, indicating that the universe could survive past it. And then obviously Dark Phoenix came out in the middle of the merger. It was a bad movie. It was probably going to be a bad movie anyway. And then you've got stuff like First Class proving that the X-Men can stand on their own two feet with only a cameo from Hugh Jackman. A cameo you could cut and lose nothing. It's just a fun joke. but It is. It works on its own terms and then you have brian singer come back which is problematic for all sorts of reasons but it's also yeah. there are no x-men except my x-men and then you keep going from there but i don't think there was any reason that the ty sheridan and so on cast had to be bad those movies didn't have to suck but 
And they just did. Yeah, I think to be honest, they probably could have branched out and done different things. They could have done a version of X Force, so they could have done a version of Excalibur. I think going back and resetting the universe, so it's three more movies or four more movies that are like the first three X Men movies. It's such a limited vision for it, and that's the thing where I kind of don't want the school. I don't want to start again at X Men two thousand. I kind of want to be there at okay, we've done all that stuff. Can we do something like Hickman's Krakoa? Can we do something like the Outback Era? Can we do something like Claremont's Excalibur? Can we just do something that isn't <laughs> this bald guy in a wheelchair with a creepy basement under his old mansion house <laughs> surrounded by children? I get that that's a large part of what the X-Men is, but it's not all the X-Men is. And it's basically all the X-Men have been on screen for the past 20 years. <laughs> and I think Marvel will take the safe route. They'll go with the familiar. I think they will do the school. Yeah, they will do the school. I don't think they're going to be branching out too far. No. And the thing is, I would have credited them with that level of experimentation not so long ago, but I don't know. It was a very rocky Phase 4. But even then, Phase 4, it felt like we were setting up a passing of the torch, because we had Shang-Chi show up. He was even going to be helped along by familiar characters, judging by the post credit scene. You had the Eternals that were going to do stuff, and we're getting a new Hawkeye, Ms. Marvel... Yeah, we're well, bringing in the Young Avengers and stuff like that. Again, this is the thing where they've announced, was it three new to be announced Marvel Studios releases between now and directly after Secret Wars? And then one that's already moved that's probably going to be Spider-Man. Yeah. Are those going to be new ideas or are they just going to be Doctor Strange 3? As you said, Spider-Man 4. Maybe Black Panther 3. We're getting another Thor, probably. We're getting a Thor 5. With no Taika Waititi in sight. I have my issues with Taika Waititi, but I think the problems with Love and Thunder were a bit more deep set than Taika Waititi. Yeah, but I don't think they should have let him go full Waititi for that movie either. <laughs> Hey, I will stand by. I still think Ragnarok is one of the best movies in the MCU. It's very good, yeah. But you don't get Taika Waititi to make a God the God Butcher movie. No, you don't. Then you don't get him to do the Jane as Thor arc. Compress five years of Jason Aaron Thor comics, which are very earnest, very serious, and very sincere, very recent, and very beloved, and hand them to a guy whose entire deal is, look at how irreverent I can be. <laughs> if you give Taika Waititi a Deadpool movie, in fact, that's what you do. Isn't the rumor they tried to give him Guardians? Or you give him a wacky Thor movie. Yeah. That's a bit of a palate cleanser before Infinity War. But also where there are no stakes because the previous two Thor movies made no impression whatsoever on the culture. <laughs> and I say that loving Bran as Thor, but yeah. So you wanted to talk about action. I'll get the action scene I didn't like out of the way first. It okay. was the fight in Cassandra Nova's courtyard. I felt like that was very rapid cut, shaky cam. I couldn't quite tell what was going on. There were too many moving parts. There was some cool stuff in there. I loved the visualization of Gambit's powers, for example. I thought it was really good. And that was a bit. <laughs> and again, the ferocity of Laura doing her thing and hobbling the juggernaut. Slicing the legs off the juggernaut, yeah. No one hobbles the juggernaut. But beyond that, I just felt it was a bit messy. I think if David Leach had directed that scene, it would have looked amazing, but he didn't. So I think Sean Levy does better, or Levy, however you pronounce it, does better with more intimate sort of one-on-one -on -one stuff. Just like in Real Steel, for example, those boxing matches are incredible. But also the character stuff in Real Steel. Real Steel only works because it takes its characters very seriously. I don't think Levy works well here. I'm not a big fan of it. And again, part of it is probably just the Disney stuff where it's, this is an R-rated movie, but it's an R-rated movie that's clearly marketed for kids. You have Ryan Reynolds talking about how he's taking his nine-year-old kid to go see it, for example. They're not legally advertising on YouTube kids, but they're advertising heavily on YouTube. The audience is significantly kid-oriented, and it is a Disney movie. So that kind of limits what you can do. And again, this is a, a weird weird American thing. No sex. Absolute violence, gore, brutality, guts. We can have a man take his skin off, but you cannot have actual sex on screen, which is the difference from the first Deadpool. We can't show pegging on screen. That's the difference with the first Deadpool. We can't show cocaine use on screen. That's the difference from the second Deadpool. It's really interesting. This is orated and it's very flamboyantly orated in some respects with graphic violence and blood splatter and such, but it's also very clearly within the boundaries that Disney will find acceptable for an orated <laughs> movie, which is we do not accept that men men and women have private parts. To be fair, you do have Cassandra Nova talk about flicking the bean, but you don't have anything like the sex montage from the first Deadpool. It's odd because you do notice the absence of that sort of stuff just entirely without realising that you may not put your finger on it and you may not go, okay, that is exactly what's missing. But there is a sense of it being more family friendly than the first two movies were. 
You didn't have it in the second Deadpool, really. You didn't, to be fair. But you did have things like the cocaine usage and stuff like that as well. And lots of references to the prison wallet and hepatitis and putting stuff inside of bodies and taking stuff out of bodies. And the infamous leg scene as well. Yeah, it's just sure cocking. It's weird that they take TJ Miller. It's not weird that they take TJ Miller out, to be clear. I find myself catching myself in case of things can be taken out of context. It is weird that you would both take TJ Miller out of the movie and then also keep a TJ Miller joke in where they have a line. I can't remember what it is they're discussing. It's dog pool. They describe dog pool and it's like TJ Miller would describe dog pool. Yeah. It's like Freddy Krueger face fucked a topographical map of Utah, which is a TJ Miller line. Or it's like you were giving birth anally and gave up halfway. <laughs> that sort of stuff, which is all the TJ Miller stuff from the first two. It's weird that you would take TJ Miller out, but leave in stuff where I'm going, hey, wait, wasn't there a guy who used to do that stuff? And no, don't ask any questions. <laughs> don't ask any questions. There never was a guy. He's not around. He's not one of the nine. Definitely not one of the nine. <laughs> in the action sequences I don't think Levy directs action particularly well you mentioned that sequence in the Ant-Man hands that's one of them but the bit that stands out to me is the sequence that is clearly meant to be the big action showcase which is the bit where they fight the Deadpool core and it's a long take it's a one -er. the camera kind of moves and there's lots of stabbing and action there are a couple of problems with it logistically and conceptually. First of which is that it's all immortal characters. So there's no stakes. There is the tension of, well, Nice Pool didn't have a regeneration factor, so maybe these guys don't as well. But you know instinctively they probably do. And you also know that Wolverine and Deadpool are both immortal, so no matter how badly they get stabbed, they're just going to get back up again. The other thing is that in this fight sequence, all of the characters look alike except for Wolverine. They're all dressed in shades and variants of the same red costume, so it's just logistically hard to keep track of people. And then the third thing is that it's Set to Like a Prayer, which is a good idea, basically speaking. Again, like the use of, say, Turn Back Time in Deadpool 2 or We Belong or whatever. Nice, ironic music choice. But if you have to cut that song, if you can't get to the bridge naturally, if you can't time the rhythms of your one-take action sequence to it, and you have to cut from a verse straight to the chorus without going through the bridge, you're not doing it right. You, you're not paying attention to how that scene is meant to work. There's a moment where they go off screen and then they come back on and the chorus just kind of rises. And it's like, that's not earned. That's not how that song works. <laughs> Those sequences don't really work for me. And as you said, Miller, who directed the first movie, he worked in animation. So he has a sense of action and physics. So those action sequences work. Leech is a former stuntman, but he's also directed action movies. And I know people complain about his action movies like Bullet Train or whatever, but he can put together an action sequence that looks great. I was thinking of the one take fight sequence in Atomic Blonde, which is just dazzling. That is a movie that is incredibly messy narratively and thematically and character wise. But that fight sequence where they're doing a one take fight sequence up a set of stairs, which is just two things that are impossible to ask of stunt people, and it looks gorgeous, and they do a fantastic job. Whereas here, it's a one take, but they're going from left to right. A lot of it happens off screen in the bus, and then we do a cut away in the middle of it to see Blind Al have her one-liner, and then we cut back. I don't know if you know what you're trying to do, so I don't know if you're failing at it. Levy, as an action director, doesn't really work for me, and I found myself liking this movie a bit less than the other two Deadpool movies, because I did feel like they were more interesting to watch. They were more exciting to watch. I enjoyed that sequence, actually. Okay. I was entertained by it. Yeah, they're all invincible, and ultimately, when everybody's invincible, you need to find creative ways to get out of the fight. You reference Fast and furious they're invincible <laughs> yeah all their fights end with they both throw an equal number of punches yes and kicks and headlocks yeah and then the ground will fall beneath their feet and then they won't be able to fight anymore and then they'll team up yeah so the creative way they solve that action sequence is peter comes along and everybody loves him i like that as a as an end point it's the ongoing joke of he's just this ordinary guy but deadpool utterly adores the guy for some reason and i would like it better if he wasn't wearing the uniform if peter just rides up on a bike looking like a regular guy and he's the only person in this final stretch of the movie who looks like a human being that would work for me much better than he rides up wearing the dead and i know the joke is rob delaney has a bit of a posh so he does the deadpool uniform doesn't fit him i do kind of feel like if peter rides up just looking like a normal guy and everyone's like oh my god it's peter it would work so much better than peter dresses like dead and everyone's like, oh, it's Peter! He looks like me for some reason, but it's Peter! We all love Peter! There is the weird bit where they jump out of the bus and then you see a CGI Wolverine standing there doing an idle animation from a video game. <laughs> where he's just moving back and forth, sort of snarling. Why couldn't Hugh Jackman have done that? 
Press start to play. It does underscore the fact that, and maybe it's because the Deadpool 3D model has been around for as long as it has. The Deadpool 3D model is actually pretty good. I think you mentioned the mask being very expressive. The 3D Wolverine model is not as good because obviously that's a fresh one we just made for this movie. To be fair, I do think the costume is an issue. I think Deadpool's costume lends itself to CGI animation. Oh, it's been brightened for this one, which is a bit weird. Yeah. You need to sell different toys, I guess, or popcorn buckets or whatever they're trying to sell for this movie. Whatever the brand is, yeah. Yeah, but... That sequence largely worked for me. I liked their first brief fight in the desert before they're interrupted by Johnny Storm. And I even liked the riff on the Avengers there where there's two heroes fighting and then Chris Evans jumps in to stop them. That's what Captain America do when Thor and Iron Man are knocking lumps out of each other. So that was a a nice riff on that, I think. And the the one which we alluded to earlier in the car, I like that as well. Again, it's two invincible people. They just fight until they get too tired and fall asleep. So it's the idea that they're just venting frustrations and basically... Logan has hit a nerve by insulting Vanessa. And then that's the line. That's where all the jokes stop until they start again almost immediately after when they're fighting. But I like that one. I think they made good use of the limited space that was the car. So those one-on-one ones worked for me more. But I did like the multiple Deadpools one as well. Yeah, I don't know. Again, it's the fact that they're both immortal and the fact that they do it twice and the fact that, you know, they're going to make up at the end of it and there's no real stakes. I find it hard to get invested in those for those reasons. Because I know these characters, I wasn't expecting there to be any threat of death. I know, but not even the emotional things where I know that not by the end of the movie, by the end of the next scene, they will be back together on their adventures. The movie treats it as this big momentous thing. You have the moment where Deadpool's like, nerds, get your special sock ready. This is going to be good. But why is it good? Why do you think I want to see this? And why do you think I want to see this in this context? What is it about this fight between Deadpool and Wolverine that is so special, that is so exciting that I get to see it? And the answer is because it's in a movie, I guess. I need just a little more than that. I need you to give me just something. And it's like, best we got, it's in a movie. And how about if we do it again? But hold on, the selling point of the fight you just had was that finally Deadpool and Wolverine are going to fight in a movie. What's the selling point for the second one? What if Deadpool and Wolverine fight in a movie again? Well, I was okay with it. Logan's crossed a line here. Yeah. He said the wrong thing. I like that confrontation. I like the emotion of that because it feels like two people having an actual conversation. But I, when you get into the, and again, the kind of juvenile car sex thing, I want to be clear, the first two Deadpool movies, they weren't really progressive champions of diversity, but they were transgressive in interesting ways. The first movie has Ryan Reynolds, a legitimate movie star, being pegged by his girlfriend. And he doesn't enjoy it. And the joke is, oh, he's uncomfortable doing it. But it's still the only depiction in a several hundred million dollar blockbuster I can think of where a couple experimenting sexually involving penetration of the man by the woman is depicted on screen as a loving act and as part of a natural and healthy sex life, which I think is progressive and is something that is a milestone in pop culture. In the second one, obviously, you've got Negasonic Teenage Warhead and Yukio, and they're acknowledged as girlfriends to one another. And here, you have the two of them together, but they barely touch. They don't kiss. There's not a single line of dialogue that explains their relationship to one another if you don't understand from the previous movie that they are girlfriends. And in contrast to that, you have this scene where it's like, ha 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 ha, isn't it funny that the two men are fighting in the car and it's like they're having sex, but they're not, they're fighting. I want to be clear, I'm not outraged, I'm not angry, I'm not quote unquote trying to cancel Deadpool as he jokes (laughs) later on when Blade uses the or word. I find myself just tired by it. It's not transgressive. It's a common issue in Disney films, isn't it, where they have gay characters, but they cut around it so they can sell it to China. Yeah. The Rise of Skywalker, there's two women kissing, but you can cut it immediately because it's so easily lifted. Or like the exclusively gay moment in Live Action Beauty and the Beast, where if you didn't tell somebody that was quote unquote an exclusively gay moment, they wouldn't know it. Or the lesbian cop in Onward, who I think makes a casual reference to her wife, but again, you don't really see it on screen. It's a monster, so you don't really know the gender of it. Jungle Cruise, there's a gay character in that as well. Jack White is, isn't he? He's supposed to be gay, but obviously there's no male character that he's interested in, so it doesn't really come up. Like a bit of a Dumbledore type situation. Never really came up, but it was totally gay the whole time. (laughs) I don't think the Fox Deadpool movies were radical bastions of progressiveness, but it does feel like this is a much more Disney micromanaged, we want this to cross a billion dollars, so there are certain things you can't do, and those things are pegging. Those things are acknowledging that Yukio is Negasonic Teenage Warhead's girlfriend, rather than just another girl who she's constantly in shot with, but is never going to touch or kiss. I keep coming back to being cynical, and I'm sorry I am cynical, but it's a movie that I think invites that cynicism. 
Well, that's why I thought this conversation was going to be so interesting because you liked the film a lot less than I did. It's good to debate it. And I don't think either of us are trying to win an argument here as well. No, no. I think that's the key because you see people online arguing till they're blue in the face because they just want to get the last word and they want to win. And I don't want to do that. I want to have a conversation about these things. I don't think I'm right. Now, you should be like Michael Fassbender and Steve Jobs. I fought for the film because I thought I was right. I still think I'm right. And I'm right. (laughs) Love that line so much. So I think if you have people that are happy to debate without trying to win, then I think you can... Yeah, and without devaluing others' experience. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad people are enjoying it. And honestly, do I wish I enjoyed it more? Of course I wish I enjoyed it more. Who wins in this situation? You who had a good time watching it or me who didn't? You who did, very clearly. Oh, great. I came out of this and hated it. That's what I wanted, isn't it? I wanted to spend two hours hating something. Yeah, which is the weird thing that people seem to think about critics. Again, not to put too fine a point in it, but the whole critics are elitist snobs who don't like Deadpool and Wolverine because it's fun. A week ago, we all loved Twisters. (laughs) This week everybody's raving about M. Night Shyamalan's trap. Critics aren't these weird hoity-toity monocle-wearing individuals who are so shocked by anything remotely resembling enjoyable fun. Although those do exist. There's people that have lost the passion for their craft, isn't there? As Ratatouille has taught us. <laughs> I think it's weird that people, and I've interacted with them, because I do complain, because I share my opinions about stuff online. When I post 50 tweets about how much I love Logan, everyone's like, yeah, we love it, it's fantastic. When I post three tweets about how much I dislike Deadpool and Wolverine, all of a sudden my mentions become unusable. <laughs> and there is this weird sense of trying to typecast people who dislike this movie by saying, oh, well, obviously you disliked the previous Deadpool movie, so of course you dislike this one. No, no, I don't. Obviously, you don't like comic book movies. No, I love comic book movies. Obviously, you hate Marvel. No, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was in my top 10 last year. It is interesting. I do find that element of debate, which I'm very glad to say this has not been. Thank you, Craig. I find that element really tiring and exhausting and makes it hard to talk about this. I joked that I have a week of talking about Deadpool and Wolverine in front of me now. (laughs) I kind of am dreading it because I know I'm going to get the people who are going to be like, nah, man, you hate fun, or nah, man, you hate the two Deadpool movies, or nah, man, you're just some stuffy critic who likes black and white foreign films, and it's not (laughs) racist for me to say that for some reason. I like stabby movies. I like cutty movies. I like when knives go into things. I like when knives go out of things. What more can you want? And sometimes I can get defensive about opinions if I feel like someone is coming at it from a bad faith direction, which a lot of people do, unfortunately, with these things. You can sort of sense there's something underlying a lot of the time. Sometimes I feel like it might just be insecurity about their own opinion. They're looking for validation. They're looking for someone to agree with them just to make them feel like they're not on an island. And the thing is, I'm often on the other side of popular opinion when it comes to stuff. I didn't think the Batman was that great, for example. So just shoot me. (laughs) I just didn't. And I hated Joker, which kind of puts me on the other side of a large portion of opinion as well. And I'm happy to live there, but I get why it might be frustrating if just nobody's agreeing with you and everybody sees this kind of flawless masterpiece when you don't and whatever. Yeah, the weird attacks people go on just for their opinion about a comic movie. Exactly. But ah, such is life. But no, I don't think this has been a fun discussion, to be fair. Me too. Yeah, I think it's been good. And it's been good to dig into the weeds of what we think works and doesn't about the film. So the action for me, interestingly, I feel like there wasn't a lot of action, which is unusual for an MCU movie these days. I think you have a steady trip of action, to be fair. There's a fair amount, but I think we've become used to action sequences kicking off every 10 minutes or so in some of the other ones. To be fair, they're not that far off here. Obviously, you have the opening sequence with the TVA. Then you have like 10 minutes of exposition. It's a very brief hallway fight, but he's abducted in the hallway. So what do you do then? He, you have the info dump with Mr. Paradox. He gets sent to the void. Oh, no, no. There's the montage before that. He finds the montage of Wolverine, which I guess is a kind of a fan servicey montage. So I guess maybe that's a long gap. Then you have him sent to the void. You have the fight with Sabretooth. Well, you have the fight with Pyro, and then you have the fight with Sabretooth, and then you have them go to Cassandra Nova. That's not an action sequence. It's more of a tense thriller sequence. There is a bit in the middle where they just go on a journey, I guess. But even within that, you have, oh my God, that's why you have the car fight. <laughs> Because there's a gap there where there isn't a lot of action between the escape from Cassandra Nova and the second confrontation with Cassandra Nova. This just can't see, but I'm, I'm actually rubbing my forehead. That word, cynical. I just realized something about how this movie is constructed and it hurt me. But I didn't feel like I was being overwhelmed by action sequences in the way that yeah, I have felt in some Marvel movies. Which ones are you thinking of out of curiosity? 
I don't know, actually. That's the thing. It's more just a general vibe, I guess. Okay. Because this movie does have the everything's dying third act thing, which I really disliked in Shang-Chi. I loved the first two thirds of Shang-Chi. And then the final third just turns into CGI goop and colour ray bands being fired at one another. And this movie does kind of have that where she's shredding. Was it that line from Doctor Who? The destruction of reality itself! (laughs) Where the stakes get so escalated that they make no sense whatsoever. And you have people looking at a screen with percentage numbers on it. Yeah, which always get to zero, but don't worry, you can always just hit F5 and refresh and get it right back. <laughs> yeah. Although, despite the genericness of that whole, oh, the reality is coming apart, I did like the ultimate buddy comedy thing of, you've got a situation where they both need to be there and they need to hold hands, they need to do this together. And I found myself quite moved by the whole oh, okay. flashbacks to stuff that was never said in some cases. <laughs> At no point did Wolverine say, I am the X-Man. <laughs> But I bought into that. And then you had the little comedy beat of Hugh Jackman gets to show off the body, worked very hard to sculpt. And you had Deadpool look at it and just nod. He's like, yep. And then the callback to a couple of minutes later, where it's put your greasy tits away, you (laughs) breeding slut. Hands him a hoodie. That's a term you could get cancelled on, isn't it? Calling someone a slut. I don't think if you call a guy, it's one of those things where it is a very much a gendered insult. Yeah. It's like the, she's had a baby. You can't even tell. Can you say that? I identify as a feminist. He's allowed to say that because he's his wife, I guess. Yeah. And presumably because he cleared it with her beforehand, to be fair. Yeah. I don't know enough about what Blake Lively sounds like to recognise that it was her, but I'm happy to accept it was her. She does have a distinct voice, to be fair. Matthew McConaughey is Cowboy Pool. And Nathan Fillion is Head Pool. Head Pool, that's from Old Man Logan, isn't it? Marvel Zombies. Is there a version of Deadpool in Old Man Logan or am I misremembering? I think Old Man Logan might have been just before Deadpool exploded. There was a while where he was popular, but he wasn't super everywhere. And I must say Old Man Logan's about 2006, it's around the time of Civil War. Whose head is he carrying around in Old Man Logan then? Am I just making that up? No, it's Batman Last Night on Earth where Batman's carrying the Joker's head around. Oh, okay. In Old Man Logan, he's carrying a portion of Super Soldier Serum with Hawkeye. Right. Hawkeye takes him on a road trip and it turns out it's Super Soldier Serum. Okay. In the United States, that's ruled by the Red Skull. I need to reread Old Man Logan. <laughs> um, I don't know that you do, Craig. <laughs> I like that story a bit more than most people, but it's Mark Miller being Mark Miller. The fact that Logan came from Old Man Logan is probably the best thing about Logan. For some reason, I have a memory of a decapitated Captain America or decapitated whatever, I don't know. It's a Marvel Zombies thing, is I think the head pool, where they decapitated Deadpool, but he's still obviously talking and sassing despite being just a disembodied head. Which they did in What If with Paul Rudd. Yeah. It was Iron Man. Was it actually Paul Rudd? Probably. Because we didn't have the rights clearance the end. <laughs> we just hadn't done all the paperwork. Yeah. Paul Rudd finally aged, though. That's about the only MCU reference there is. It's an old man Logan reference. That's Fim Falls, I believe. It's fine as he uses a bridge or something, if I remember correctly. Okay. You remember it better than I do. But yeah, I thought that ending was, was fine. And then Logan gets accepted into the fold. I'll see you around. Probably not. No, you definitely will. I don't know what I was expecting the ending to be, actually. I didn't quite expect it to be Logan becoming was just part of Deadpool's little family and you'll be back. <laughs> if we can afford enough money. Hey, if Robert Downey Jr. is getting 80 million plus, I want 80 million plus. Could be the next conversation. Yeah, Jesus. I suspect they probably signed the deal with Jackman before they went public with Downey. The wonders of negotiate Marvel, nothing if not savvy. I wonder how much Jackman got for this though. A significant amount, I reckon. Yeah, it's crazy. Do you have anything else you like to say about this movie before we wrap up this predictably long conversation? No, I think this is about it. I'm actually surprised it ran so long. I'm not surprised it ran this long. Not my cup of tea. was not a huge fan of it. Kind of worn out by it. And it's weird because, first of all, generally softer on the Marvel stuff than most people are. By reference, I really enjoyed Multiverse of Madness. I really enjoyed Loki. Generally more optimistic about the state of modern cinema than most people are. I think we've had a pretty good summer in terms of the quality of blockbusters that we've had. I think Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Oh yeah, Twisters is proper old school. Yeah, even A Quiet Place Day 1 is legitimately wonderful. But yeah, this just zonked me. It just drained me. I don't know why. I think it might have been because I liked Deadpool and Deadpool 2. And I was like, okay, let's do this again. This is going to be fun. And it just did not click for me in the ways that it should have, unfortunately. So you went in thinking, let's fucking go. And then left it not thinking that. Yeah. 
One last thing I want to talk about, just a post-credit scene where you got just a line of filth from Chris Evans. It's one of those things, I love these post-credit scenes, which are almost parodies of post-credit scenes, where you get the entire audience to sit through the credits because they assume they're going to see some big hint to what's coming next. They're going to see Doom or whatever, or what the new gang variant looks like. And then at the end, it's just effectively a joke about how pointless post-credit scenes are. The big one I think of is the Doctor Strange one. It's over! I love that so much. Oh, there's the Spider-Man Homecoming one, which yeah. also featured Chris Evans. How many more of these are we doing? Can you believe you sat so long for something so disappointing? <laughs> Even say the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 one where there's, is it seven or nine post credit scenes where they're all just completely delightfully nonsense? But here I like this one and it's also a pretty good joke. You spend most of the movie thinking that Deadpool got Johnny killed by running Deadpool's mouth. Deadpool just made it all up. Because <laughs> the way that even Logan behaves and the way that John's like, I would never say that. I don't even know what those words mean. And then seeing him just rattle it off. It's a really good payoff. It is maybe the best joke in the film. That's it. I did also like the, there's only ever going to be one blade. If only because that felt so... So passive aggressive. <laughs> and like I said, it's a joke that's changed as well because yeah. you could read it as, well, no, they're making another one. He totally had that voice cameo in Eternals. Yeah, yeah. There has been several blades since the TV guy again. Such a subtle cameo that everybody had to look up what was going on after they saw the film because it just was not clear. I don't know about you. Black Knight is going to be a billion dollar grocer. <laughs> You know that there was a point where Marvel was so on top of it that somebody probably said Black Knight billion dollars. Could have happened, yeah. Maybe a days or two ago. All due respect to Captain Marvel, which is, in my opinion, a three-star movie, but it lands in the perfect place. And it lands in the perfect place where there's this pent-up appetite, this pent-up desire, and it's sandwiched between the two gigantic blockbusters, and people are like, yeah, one billion dollars for Captain Marvel. And again, I don't hate Captain Marvel. Three-star film? I think it's three-star film as well, yeah. When you look at the billion-dollar grocers and you're like, I can see why that's there. I can see why that's there. I can see... Cap- what? Well, considering the MCU started with a procession of adaptations of characters nobody had heard of, I knew who yeah. Iron Man was, but no one else did. Again, in terms of this mythical general audience person that doesn't know anything outside the film they're watching, but I just assumed that these characters were household names, but they just weren't. The Hulk was probably the closest. Yes, because he had a TV show. But yeah, Captain America, maybe people had heard of him in sort of the abstract. He had to be sold internationally as the first Avenger, is one of my favourite details about that. Yeah, and that's ultimately what the Avengers were in the comics as well. It was a dumping ground for characters that can't sell their own comics. So we'll put them together and see what happens. It's funny how the MCU is, yes, yeah, where all the A-listers go, and it's, well, no, we didn't start that way. Everybody wants to be on the Avengers. And I am old enough to remember when you guys were eating the X-Men's dirt. <laughs> When you were like third to the Fantastic Four. I'm looking at the cartoons that I watched in the 90s. There was Spider-Man, there was X-Men, there was Iron Man, there was the Fantastic Four, there was the Hulk. There was no Avengers cartoon. No, the Avengers, again, it was it was a holding idea from characters that couldn't support their own books. But those cartoons did quite well, I guess. The idea that they were reworked around about 2005 with Mark Miller and Brian Hitch's The Ultimates with David Finch's and Brian Bendis's New Avengers. And it was like, no, this is the spine of the Marvel Universe, which is that corporate synergy between film and television where it's like, well, these are the toys that we're left with, <laughs> so they're going to be the stars of our shared universe. Yeah, then she cast charismatic A-list-ish actors to play these B-list characters and you get this kind of weird alchemy. I don't know that Evans and Hemsworth are A-list actors. And to be fair, Downey, he was seen as a huge risk. He was uninsurable. Yeah, there was that. But it was kind of that alchemy of character and actor that helped that happen. And then you had Suicide Squad fail to replicate that by shoving A-list actors into B-list character roles. So a dead shot played by Will Smith. This doesn't work because <laughs> you forgot to make a good movie. Well, it made $800 million. Terrible movie. It made, what, $800 million? Did it? $600 million? It was a huge box office success. So much so they'd never bothered doing it again. Well, they did with The Suicide Squad, which was not a success, despite being an infinitely better movie. But let me just check and see what The Suicide Squad box office was here. It did come out during the pandemic, to be fair. Yes. I think Scott Mendelson also makes the argument it's a Fool Me Once sequel, where you have some things that are bulletproof concepts that people will go and see, like he mentions the Tomb Raider movie, Suicide Squad, but when you release a sequel to them, people have learnt and have been burnt. Yeah, so $750 million. Wow. Yeah. And that's for not David Ayer's Suicide Squad. Yeah. It's the Tim Burton Planned the Apes. Tim Burton's Planned the Apes made a crazy amount of money, but Warner's, I believe it was at the time, were smart enough to go, well, we got really lucky <laughs> and let's not push it. Let's not do that again. Massively profitable. Everybody's very happy, but let's not take a gamble on that again. 
<laughs> and on the subject of films you should only make once, I think this is one of them. I don't think you should do this again. I enjoyed it fine the first time, but I don't think you could do a kind of love letter to the Fox slash New Line era of Marvel movies. Certainly not in the same way. But I think you've done it now. And I think you've acknowledged that these things are important and we're going to just draw a line under them and we're going to move on with whatever we're going to do next, which might be X-Men movies in the MCU, it might not be. But also, I think one thing it does is it sort of reminds you that this connectivity that we're all sold on when the MCU started, it might not be the be all and end all of this because these films existed before and some of them are basically fine by themselves. But at the same time, they're all folded into them. This is all part of the TVA. I know Deadpool's not part of the sacred timeline, but he exists in relationship to the sacred timeline. The TVA still police these universes. They still exist under the Marvel umbrella and travel between them is still... I can see what the argument is, but I'm also so jaundiced or so so jaded by the experience with modern intellectual property. It does feel like a bit of a having a cake and eating it situation. It's a bit like what the CW did when they did their Crisis and Infinite Earths version. It's just every DC live action thing you've ever seen all exists as part of this multiverse and we can interact with at least some of them. And... I think they did it okay. Well, given the constraints on them, yeah. The thing with the CW shows is they're not always great, but what I saw of them, you're doing pretty well within the confines of having to do it on a TV budget on a weekly basis. With constraints from your overlords at Warner Brothers who say you can and can't do certain things. Yeah. I think the stuff they managed to pull off was great. I love the Arrowverse. And I think their approach to multiverse storytelling is better than anything else that's ever tried it. Certainly the other time they tried it in DC with the Flash (laughs) movie. The Flash TV show did it better. Yeah. In this case, the Marvel multiverse does include all these weird disparate projects that you maybe forget about. You know what other ones we might see brought back in some way? Ghost Rider. The worry for me is that it leads to things like the announcement of Downey's Doom. It doesn't necessarily lead to an ABC of, well, let's bring the Fantastic Forecast back together. It just leads to something like, well, let's just bring back Chris Evans as not Captain America. I don't know. Chris Hemsworth is going to be playing Thunderstrike or something. And it, the entire point of that character is you have a character who's not Thor doing it. Yeah. Chris Evans playing Magneto. By the logic of the Doctor Doom casting. Chris Hemsworth is Apocalypse. <laughs> and the thing is, of the whole, if they'd actually announced that Robert Downey Jr. will be playing an evil Iron Man variant, that would be the next villain. I'd be okay with that, because then it's the idea of the person that built this universe is now trying to tear it apart, and you have to stop him. But again, the question is, do you trust them to carry that off? I think there is a great story you can tell with the idea of Downey as the ultimate villain of this Marvel universe, and the possibility that this is going to lead to a reboot, or a soft reboot that will lead to the X. Men being incorporated into the shared universe. There is a story you can tell there that's interesting about this idea of nostalgia and the poisoning toxic nostalgia where you have to escape the past. The Marvel universe has to outgrow what Iron Man created. It has to move past the post 9-11 superhero movie. It has to move past this idea of continuity and as you said the shared universe interconnectivity and you have to in order to do that you bring back Robert Downey Jr. as Doom and you kill him off. And that is a statement of intent and purpose. And you make him an embodiment of all the worst aspects and the worst legacy of that sort of storytelling. And the thing is, I do not trust Marvel Studios or Disney to do that no. in this modern climate because they know the internet would tear them apart. It's the same thing with a small example as it is, the thing I mentioned with the suit, where it's if you're using Wolverine's suit as a storytelling tool, it needs to have an arc and that means it needs to change. And if it's a suit, that means he either has to start not wearing it and end wearing it, or start wearing it and end not wearing it. You have to pick an arc. You can't do both. But the movie's like, nah, I'm going to do both. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should put my money where my mouth is and bet you five euro, Craig. But Doom will not be a monstrous, unforgivable evil who has to be killed off at the end of Secret Wars. Doom will get a happy ending at the end of Secret Wars. We'll bet a fiver that Doom will have a happy, satisfying ending where he learns the power of love. Maybe he sacrifices himself. Maybe he redeems himself. Maybe Reed Richards creates an alternate universe where he gets to be happy, like at the end of Hickman's Secret Wars. But I guarantee you that you will not get an ironic mirror of Tony Stark's self-sacrifice in Endgame, where Doom is killed rather than sacrificing himself. Doom will get a happy ending or Doom will die a hero at the end of Secret Wars. I am almost certain of that because there's no way that Marvel Studios have the fortitude to risk the internet's reaction if it dared do the opposite. And then it's all the the weird stuff. What's it going to be like when Tom Holland's Spider-Man sees him and it's like, what about his arch nemesis Reed Richards? Does no one care about that? <laughs> well, obviously not. And obviously Marvel don't care about that. They wouldn't have brought back that face if they'd 
didn't. But I think a riff on Superior Iron Man would be a better call than Doom. And the thing is, they might be lying to us. They might not go down the route that's expected. So maybe it will end up being Tony Stark, who just calls himself Doctor Doom. The thing with Superior Iron Man is that Superior Iron Man is a concept that only really works with Tony Stark being Tony Stark for as long as he has and then turning evil. It's not an evil Iron Man from the start. This is a character who has built a reputation as a hero and who then uses that to do horrible things. I don't think that they'll do that. That would be a fun and interesting thing to do. That idea of you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Literally personified. If Tony Stark didn't die by being impaled by Thanos, does he end up being a supervillain? I would love to see it, but can you imagine how hard that would go down like a lead balloon in the office room where they're pitching it? So what we want to do is we want to argue that's a good thing that Tony died in Endgame and it would be a bad thing if the MCU was haunted by the ghosts of its past. And you're like, yeah, but the movie where he brought back uh, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine just made a billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's a strange era we're moving into of superhero moviedom. May you live in interesting times. So if that was everything you wanted to say, then we can go back to our separate universes. To Madonna's like a prayer. Well, we may do. <laughs> we'll see. Thanks very much for joining for this long Deadpool and Wolverine discussion. Why don't you tell the listeners where they can find you since you're from a different universe? Just follow me on Twitter at Darren underscore Mooney. I'm writing at Second Wind. I'm doing videos at Second Wind. Just Google Darren Mooney and I'll turn up. I'm, I'm always doing stuff. That's succinct. I know your links will be in the show notes as well. Perfect. Thank you. That was our discussion on Deadpool and Wolverine. I would like to thank Andrea Montano if that's how you pronounce your name, apologies, it will be in the show notes for the supplied music. If you like what you heard, please do hit subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcasts, it will be in your feed. And usually there's an option to rate and review, and normally it's in the form of stars. So Darren, how many stars should they give us on these platforms? I would pick up five starfish off the beach and I would throw them all into the ocean. And by that, I mean, give a five star review. It would make a difference to all five of those starfish. Uh, It would indeed. If you want to discuss Deadpool and Wolverine, the X-Men, Marvel Cinematic Universe, anything that we discussed here, Deep Space Nine, we talked about that. You can hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, or Blue Sky under Neil Before Blog, or leave a comment under neilbeforeblog.co.uk. You can also join us on Discord, where we have an engaged community of a listener who likes to engage with our content. So please do join and help make that a plural. Jump into the void, if you will. We promise we won't stick our fingers in your face and and read your mind. Or at least sanitize them first. Yeah, I will wash my hand. I will go as far as that. Where is the intimacy coordinator? Yeah, exactly. For more in-depth nerdy discussions like this, for interviews and for a monthly news podcast, you can continue joining us all the time on Neil Before Pot. Like a brand, I'm a